Then a call to order the Wilmington School Committee meeting of Wednesday, October 24th. You could all join me in reciting our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tristan, for a minute, just slip a minute to reflect that all members are present this evening. Thank you very much. Our first item of business this evening is our consent agenda. It looks like we've got uh, five individual items. The first one being the approval of our meeting minutes from October 10th, a regular session. Could I have a motion to approve those minutes, please, Mrs. Bryson? Thank you. Seconded by Mr. Talbot. Thank you. All those in favor? Thank you. And we've got a couple abstentions this evening, Mr. Ragsdale and Mr. Bjork. And then we also have the approval of the union office donation to the Wilmington Public Schools in the amount of $1,000. Dr. Brand, would you like to share any information on that? Uh, no, but as always, uh, with uh, much gratitude, uh, the support um, that uh, comes from members of our community, as I've had the chance to come to learn thus far, is really incredible. And this is yet again another example. So That's thank you. That's great. I'm sure we can use $1,000 quite readily. Could I have a motion to accept a donation of $1,000 by the union office to Wilmington Public Schools? Mr. Bjork, thank you. Second in. Mrs. Burns, thank you. All those in favor? That would be unanimous. Thank you very much. All right, we have a smaller list of warrants this evening. Julie, we have. Can I make one quick comment on sure. The was that uh, they requested that we let them know what yes. we use it for, and yes. I would hope that we would that we would do that and make a make a point of noting when we decide what to do. Absolutely, I've made notice of that as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Ragsdale. Okay, moving on to the warrants. We ha I'm going to read them as a group. We have R210, L20, 21, and 22, FS0809, and 10. Could I have a motion to approve those warrants, please? Mrs. Bryson, thank you. Seconded, Mr. Ragsdale. All those in favor? That would be unanimous. Thank you. We have the payroll warrant for week ending October 24th. Could I have a motion to approve the payroll warrant, please? Mrs. Newhouse, thank you. Seconded by Mr. Ragsdale, thank you. All those in favor? That looks like unanimous. We have the warrant item CB03. Can I have a motion to approve, Mrs. Bryson? Thank you. Mr. Talbot, thank you. Second, all those in favor? Let's see, we've got two abstentions, Mrs. Burns and Mr. Bjork. And then finally, we have the SPED warrants. We have SPED 08 and SPED 09. Could I have a motion to approve those, please? Mr. Ragsdale, seconded by Mr. Talbot. Thank you, all those in favor? We've got a couple abstentions, Mrs. Burns and Mr. Bjork. Thank you. Moving on to our superintendent's report. Dr. Brand, if you would, please. Thank you very much, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, two items that are uh, called to your attention uh, and for members of the community that uh, are uh, taking the opportunity to review the packet. Um, both of these uh, pertain to our student services department, and um, so at this time, uh, I'll ask uh, Alice uh, to come up, she, if she would. These are uh, uh, special in order, special education IEP procedures. The first one, um, uh, really comes on uh, in the wake of the discussion at our last committee meeting uh, uh, specific to uh, the one of the uh, resolutions for the MASC and I know that there um, uh, one of the things that, that I have learned is that many in the community watch these meetings and that's a good thing uh, that's a great thing uh, but certainly uh, some of the conversation around this table engendered some interest and curiosity uh, and so it's with that that this first uh, item is, is, is it's brief but just a, a sort of a recap of uh, the guidelines that pertain to IEP procedures. Uh, and then to keep flow going, I'll ask Alice to just briefly talk to the memo that's uh, at your table that Tristan distributed this evening, but will be included in the packet when it's reposted. And that's an update on the corrective action plan related to the CPR actions. And uh, Alice and, and her uh, department have, as of others, have been very, very busy. And this is just an effort to try and provide the committee and the community with a brief update on some of the actions to date. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alice. Sure. Thanks. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good to see you. 
I thought it would be just kind of a, this is very brief, kind of the PowerPoint, but just maybe a starting point in terms of conversation. I figured they would generate some questions. So I thought I would give just a general overview of the larger timelines. There are lots of other kind of very small timelines as well um, around the special ed process and, and thought then if people had questions, we could do that. Um, <clears throat> So we have two laws that govern special education. We have the federal law, which is the Individuals um, with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, which sets, sets kind of the bottom baseline um, expectation for timelines, uh, what the process should look like in each state. Um, in Massachusetts, we've got uh, the general law 603 CMR 28, which can take the federal law and become more restrictive and set, but they can't essentially go um, less stringent than the federal law is kind of the way of looking at it. So the next slide I'm going to show you kind of has a little bit of both to it. Um, everything in white uh, is the Massachusetts expectation for timelines. Everything in red is what's set by the um, IDEA. Massachusetts kind of tightens up their timelines and some of the procedures around special ed. So the timelines are different inside Massachusetts than let's say our closest neighbor who follows the federal law more stringently such as New Hampshire. Um, so I use New Hampshire as an example just because kind of our closest neighbor that follows IDEA rather than having set closer parameters on the timelines. So <clears throat> from the time the district gets a, a consent, so if a, a referral, excuse me, on a student for whom either a parent or a daycare provider early intervention or an IST team, teacher assistance team, decides that a student should be referred and evaluated, we have five days to get the consent to the parents. Um, in federal law, it's actually 15 days, but in Massachusetts, you have five school days. Most days, as it refers to the, the um, school, is school days. If it's a parent day, it refers to um, calendar days. So generally, the law is written differently because parents are parents all the time. Schools have them only during school hours is, I think, kind of the thought. Um, within 30 school days of having that signed consent, so you receive a referral from, um, let's say, an IST team that would like a child evaluated inside their school. I have five days to get the consent of the parent. The parent can really take as long as they want to sign or not sign the consent. Once we receive that consent, we have 30 school days to evaluate that child. And so I know it seems like a long time, 30 school days is six weeks-ish approximately. And for a student though that might be having, let's say, um, multiple assessments, so for example, um, an academic assessment which could take somewhere between three and four sessions to give because they try not to pull a kid for four or five hours straight, certainly don't want to pull them out of most content areas. Um, and or some specials at some schools are also things that you can't pull from because of the infrequency with which they have them. Um, so they are mindful about when you pull a student. If they're having a psychological evaluation, you could be in the same situation where they might get for, pulled for a couple of hours over four or five sessions um, as well as be observed. The child is also having, let's say, a speech and language. You might be looking at at least a couple of sessions, maybe three, depending on the student's ability to kind of tolerate the testing over a long period of time. If they're having an OT, probably a little shorter, maybe one or two sessions over a couple of hours. They have a PT, they're then pulled also out one or two sessions out of a classroom. So when you look at the totality of the amount of sessions and not wanting to pull a, a student from class and do two different kinds of testing in the same days, when you kind of add those up, there is a lot of days that the student is actually being evaluated inside that 30-day timeline. So the district has to complete the evaluation piece, not the report writing, but the evaluation piece in that 30-day school day timeline. And then the in entire timeline is essentially 45 days from the consent to the time that the IEP has to essentially be generated um, at the meeting. Um, so if you have the 30 days for the evaluations, you essentially have then 15 days left for people to write the reports, ensure that those reports go to parents at least 48 hours or two days ahead of the um, IEP meeting, hold the IEP meeting, generate the IEP and send it home to the parent as well. So generally IEP meetings are not held on day 45 has been my directive. Uh, I'm hoping that they're hold somewhere around day 38 or 40 because life happens, people get sick, 
um, you know, parents have to reschedule and things happen and it's important that we stay because we all of our reporting goes to the state um, around how many days from the time we receive the referral to consent. The state is, you know, all the indicators for the state, we have to report those things every year. But the 45 day timeline is probably the most important of that um, group of timelines. So we have to account for our count between October 1 and December 1 of each year, um, how many of our referrals actually were within the 45 day timeline each year. Um, <clears throat> so. For the second kind of bullet point, it just talks a little bit about the, um, the two days in advance of a team meeting. So if we hold the meeting, let's say at day 40, uh, that means the reports have to be to the parents by day 38 in the timeline, right? Um, which give, is giving evaluators, um, if they finish by day 30, eight days to, evaluate, to write their reports. So and some of the reports vary in length. So a psychological evaluation could be 10 pages. Um, something like a speech and language or OT. Speech and language can also be lengthy, but if you're, you know, not a, a very involved student, it might be maybe half that length. An OT might be a little bit shorter. And remember, they're also working on multiple reports at the same time. So the timeline for the state of Massachusetts is a little tighter as it is. Um, so the, under IDEA, you are given five days ahead of the meeting, which is the five in red, um, to provide that report to the parents. However, the timeline as a whole is much greater. Under IDEA, instead of in Massachusetts having that 45-day timeline, they have a 60-day timeline for eligibility, and then they actually have a 30 days after that, they can opt to draft the actual IEP. So for an initial eval, under IDEA, the first, so the first time a student's evaluated and identified as having a disability, you have 60 days to do both, to draft the IEP and the eligibility. On a re-eval, you're given the opportunity to, to determine eligibility within the 60 days and then another 30 days potentially to draft the IEP. Massachusetts doesn't allow that. Massachusetts is a 45 straight day timeline in terms of what they, they are looking for for eligibility. Um, this is just kind of a visual of it, just to have an idea. So of the 45-day timeline, um, 30 of them are for evaluations to be completed. And so we have to account for that. Let's say when the coordinated program review um, liaisons came in, they actually took out our school calendar from um, any year that they were, were requesting to pull. They will pull out the date that the evaluations were completed, see if it was counted within that 30 day from the time the consent was completed. And so when they were looking at our compliance data, they actually used it and lined it up with when our snow days were, when we had holidays and vacations. They had multiple years worth of our school schedule for snow days going back a few years when they were pulling files. Um, so the, the timelines are extremely important for the compliance pieces, as well as also just making sure that we're generating kind of high quality um, information for all of our students. Um, and so in terms of the pushing back of the reports, it makes me a little bit concerned just because the timeline, although I know it can be a frustration for parents to feel as though the 45 day timeline if your student is struggling feels like a long time. Um, if we push back the amount of days in which the evaluators have to get those reports out, my concern becomes, are we trading off quality for um, compliance, which is something I don't want to do, um, because it's getting tight. So if you hold the meeting at day 37 or 38, and they're five days ahead, then we're only two days or so after maybe which evaluators have completed evaluations, while they're also servicing students at that time. Um, is there any questions about that? I had a separate section, but yeah. Mrs. Prince, this, I'm not going to open up Pandora's box this early okay. in the game, but we there is a resolution coming before yep. delegate. Yep. Um, it's to potentially to amend the state law. Yep. So if the federal government, just so that I'm clear, um, allows for 60 day turnaround, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And Massachusetts is 45. Is 45. Mm -hmm. Then potentially, I might want to add an addendum to my addendum. <laughs> Yep. Uh, with maybe increasing that, uh, just something for the board to consider for later on in the e uh, meeting, um, the possibility of it, because the resolution deals with a five-day. Uh, for review of parents for reports. Exactly. Yeah. So maybe in, in that, if they're going to, if I mean, if the delegates feel that that's something they want to take on to amend the state law, mm -hmm. then I think they would, this aspect would also be a consideration in that for the reasons that you pointed out with regards to quality reporting. So. Yeah. 
I, I can I kind of give you my Please. only? <laughs> uh, I get concerned about increasing the timeline because ultimately we are dealing with kids that are progressing through a grade level at any given point. And so while there should be, you know, gen ed, let's say for an initial evaluation for a kid, child that might be struggling, there should be some gen ed and, you know, interventions that are happening while the evaluation process is ongoing. Extending the timeline, um, I think the timeline for parents is, is a point of frustration because they, they feel as though a quarter actually passes or one fourth of the school year before their child may be identified. Um, if we extend that, I worry a little bit about, um, well, I, I, I don't know if I'm. I, I wouldn't be advocating for 60 days what the okay. federal government would allow. I think that, yeah. I, that I, for the same reasons, I yeah. certainly agree with you. But as it stands now, um, parents have, um, those assessments have to be to, pay with, to parents within 48 hours prior to the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, it, what's before us is a, a bit of a three-day extension. Yeah. You know what I mean? I would think that we'd at least consider Moving that on the on back the end. end. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, but but, for, but I, yes, yeah. no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go much okay. longer than what okay. Massachusetts. Okay, like an equal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to go to 60 days. No, 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 <laughs> yeah. no. We'll hardly agree with you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? I was just going to share, yeah, and I think this is a great visual, particularly this slide and the next computer. one. Yeah, I think a great, great visuals, very clear, very concise. Okay. For those watching at home, it might be a little bit hard to see. We've got some lights mm. that we're competing with here in the ceiling. Um, I would ask, does this sit on our school or our district website? It doesn't, but I can put it up. Oh, well, um, so no, the, uh, there is no IDEA reference on our website. Okay. I do have some of the Massachusetts regulations okay. and timelines on the website, and the okay. eligibility is on the website. But okay. I can put the PowerPoint up if that's something that I people just think would it's a very clear, yeah. concise, easy to understand yeah. snapshot here. So I appreciate okay. your efforts in doing that. I think it's I think it's great. So okay. thank you. I had one more slide. I don't know Please. if you want to. Okay. Um, which is similar, but kind of, you know, just um, looks at kind of the eligibility. And so this I, this I actually do have up on our website. Okay. So this is, for anybody that's not familiar with it, is the eligibility flow chart for any initial and reevaluations in the state of Massachusetts. And so it essentially is the decision-making document for whether a child um, becomes eligible for special education. And so, the you know, it, it literally asks you some specific questions. The first being, do you have one of the following types of disabilities? It has to fall within the IDEA and Massachusetts regulations for one of those categories of disability. Two is, so you have to answer yes. If you know, you're not eligible for special ed. Two, is the student making effective progress in school or for a reevaluation, would you not make progress without continued services, right? Um, if that's a yes and you are making effective progress, not eligible, if it's a no, you continue down the flow chart. Um, and so this is a, should be a discussion at every meeting, and I think it's important for the community at large to just be aware about what the focus of special education is. Um, looking at whether, you know, the third question is the student's lack of progress actually a result of the disability. So you have to have a disability, you have to not be making effective progress. The child's lack of progress has to be actually related to the disability and not a result of another factor. Um, the next question, do the, does the child, and this is where what special education is, does the child require specially designed instruction in order to access the curriculum? And so that is a hallmark of what goes into the IEP. Specially designed instruction becomes your goals and objectives. It becomes the content area, the methodology, or the change in the content for which the child requires um, an IEP. If you can actually have a disability, not be making effective progress, not require specially designed instruction, and require accommodations, and then we're looking at 504. And so kind of that distinction, I think, is sometimes important for people to, to, um, to understand. Um, that it's, you know, we are an intervention, but we are an intervention with a very specific protocol yeah. for individuals. Yep. Comments or questions? <coughs> no? No? Okay, we're good. Great. Thank you. Recording the program with you? Yes. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Alice. Um, yep. uh, also, uh, again, that will be incorporated as part of the packet, but uh, that Tristan distributed this evening is a memo from Alice that provides a, a just a real 
quick glimpse uh, that doesn't even come close to scratching the surface to the amount of work that Alice, her team, and many others who are also here tonight uh, have been, well. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Regan, uh, who have been putting into just this part of the response to the mm -hmm. district, uh, for the district uh, thus far. So, Alice, is there anything you want to specifically so there, you'll highlight? So there's two essentially progress reports, date, dates <clears throat> that are on the, um, set by the state. One is tomorrow, one is March 22nd. Um, pretty much anything that's training related, um, you know, document uploads are ensuring that we've provided training around, we talked about the specific learning disability paperwork and training, the uh, transition planning form training, um, the age of majority training, um, the civil rights uh, bullying training, the special education uh, laws and regulation trainings, all of those are completed. The only thing really left for the March 22nd date are the records review to prove that what we've done with the training actually carries over into real practice um, from a records review point of view. So for example, for the specific learning disability um, training, <coughs> we have to pull five students identified in every school with a specific learning disability and uh, assure that we've completed all of those documents, um, the four components for identification of a learning disability by March 22nd. Um, for the um, transition planning form, similar, it's 10 total over the course of the school year. So that's really the only um, part that's left with the exception of the special education program review and completion of that. So, yeah. With Governor Baker signing in new legislation with regard to dyslexia, yep. how does this impact um, I, this piece yep. um, as well as how we will be assessing our students? Mm -hmm. So interestingly enough, um, we, myself, Kristen Walsh and Charlotte King um, had a conference call. I, I've had a couple, um, but we had another one last week with Children's Hospital and Dr. Gaff's group um, at Children's Hospital to actually help pilot um, norming a dyslexia screener on preschool and kindergarten students inside the district and Dr. Brand, um, you know, checked into some policies and it seems like that um, is good. So I think we're going to be participating in that and there'll be some letters going out to parents to receive consent from them. Um, and so they'll be coming in to screen our kindergartners that have consent in the fall, winter and spring with our preschoolers that have consent being winter, spring and next fall. Um, their goal is to develop a um, iPad-based screening tool to screen for dyslexia that would make it user-friendly engaging for kids and user-friendly for uh, districts as well. Um, so they're looking to um, essentially do a validity study between the instruments that they're using on the iPad and already normed instruments such as the CTOP, the test of phonological processing, and some of the other um, the rap test of rapid automatic naming they would do in person with each of those students for about 45 minutes. They do a 45-minute iPad and then they look to make sure that the scores they're receiving in the same skills on the iPad are, are uh, consistent with what they're receiving on the one-to-one -one testing to make sure that there's validity between the two um, instruments. So that's, for us, that's an immediate thing, which I think is great because it also gives us a relationship with Children's Hospital. Um, so the districts are going to be asked to identify a screening tool, mm -hmm. um, which myself and a number of the SPED directors uh, through the collaborative have actually been talking about all year and looking at instruments because the, the challenge is what is the couple of skills we want to assess for to make sure that um, and I think there'll be some uh, probably technical advisories coming out from the Department of Ed around what they really want. Okay. I suspect rapid automatic naming will be one of them and some other, you know, looking at phonological processing will be one of them. There'll be a couple of um, skills that they want identified either in an instrument or a couple of instruments. And then I think we, myself, Kristen, and Charlotte are going to work together to figure out what the best way um, to do that is, whether it's built into the part of our kindergarten screenings um, which I think is probably where we're leaning to at this point, um, and just making sure that we have staff on hand to do that. And I would actually like to pilot that in the spring versus waiting another year. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, would, once you go through that pilot and find the technological mm -hmm. devices that might work best, would that be an added assessment our district would do in-house? So it would, would technically be a general education screening as mm -hmm. part of a kindergarten screening. So okay. if a student comes in, so it wouldn't be a, wouldn't be part of the special ed process. It would be much like um, you know doing some of our uh, kindergarten screenings that we do now right. for language and communication, and um, it would be just another component of that. The, with the idea being mm -hmm. that that information is readily available to, for the kindergarten when the student enters. Um, to be able to identify and monitor and intervene with that student earlier to prevent them from, you know, 
end up maybe with a dyslexia diagnosis, but certainly being able to give them the help that they need if they are demonstrating some precursors for what might be dyslexia later on. Okay. Um, so for any assessment outside of that, the early screening, would, you, would that be done outside or? I'm not sure how it's... So this, I don't think the dyslexia screen is intended to be a referral to special ed, per se. Right, right. right? It's intended to give the, them earlier data to be able to, from a curriculum point of view, monitor and intervene with those students okay. earlier. And then, and then give you the uh, one more data point to be able to say whether or not um, that student might require an earlier referral. If they, if you see in October, November, they continue to struggle. Okay. Um, and so getting back to the children's hospital piece, they actually are going to, if the parents consent, they will give us all of the student-specific information. They have to consent to share it with us. But then even for those that don't, they're going to give us aggregate data around um, just where our students are falling, coming in, um, which is going to be great just from a curriculum point of view to be able to adjust. Great. Thank so, you. Yeah, Appreciate sure. Thank you very much You're for welcome. the update on the secure. This is great. Great. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a couple more items, but first, uh, I, I know that that section was uh, mis, uh, it was misguidance in terms of its name. It really wasn't the superintendent's update. It was the director of <laughs> student support services. But in all in all seriousness, uh, I've come to learn a lot of things over the last four uh, months or so about this community and this district. And one of them certainly is that uh, the committee should know uh, and the community should know that uh, Alice. Uh, uh, we are very fortunate to have her uh, here in this role. She uh, has, uh, you know, on top of our already very busy portfolio, uh, has, has taken and tackled, I guess be a better term, the work that's associated with the CPR. Uh, this again just scratches the surface. Uh, this, uh, for members of the committee, and certainly the committee would want to know uh, that this work is being taken very seriously. Uh, there's st it's strategic and, and we're being responsive uh, in terms of the follow-up for uh, the many things that were identified for a path for our improvement, thanks to Alice, thanks to Brian was mentioned, and, and to the principals here uh, as well too, because there are lot, lots of pieces of this that uh, certainly uh, require their leadership. So uh, thank you. Well, I appreciate Two final uh, things to just note, uh, if I may. Um, I wanted to, uh, just to let the community know that um, I uh, have one final uh, uh, community uh, evening plan with the superintendent that had to be rescheduled and that's Tuesday, November the 13th. I'll have you know that I hit a dozen people the last time. <laughs> so uh, if it won't be the same jackpot as, as last evening, uh, but if I can hit 13 or 14, all the better. And that is Tuesday, November the 13th. There have been great conversations. It doesn't matter the number of people that have been out, and I've appreciated those that have taken time out of their evening. Tuesday, November the 13th at the middle school. And finally, just to let the committee know that as I continue these conversations, I've uh, with Tristan's help, uh, started to reach out to the PAC. Uh, the PACs, I know that they're, they go by different names. I'm still trying to get that straight, but throughout our community, I look forward to having the opportunity to meet with them as well, too, in the coming weeks. And that does, does it for me. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Brands. So, I'm sorry. Mrs. Burns. Dr. Forgive me. Um, could doc, what time is that middle school? It is 6.30. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. See where I have to look for that, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so normally, at this point in our agenda, we tackle any outstanding business or old business that we have. And we do have a couple of items under old business, but this is not a normal night, right? <laughs> Game two, World Series. We want to support our Red Sox. And we have a number of people in our audience this evening. So out of courtesy to our presenters, and with my fellow committee members' permission, I'd like to move things around a little bit on our agenda, and let's tackle the school improvement plans as the next agenda item. Everybody good with that? Excellent. So I think we have our early childhood centers up first. Thank you, ladies, for joining us. Thank you for having us. So good evening, and again, thank you for having us tonight. Uh, Charlotte and I are here to give a brief update, an overview of our um, improvement plan from last year, and to give you a plan for 2018-19. So I know you've been given this information prior, so I'm going to briefly go through the presentation, and if there's any questions at the end, I welcome them. 
So both the Boutwell and Wildwood School Advisory Council, we meet monthly and both early childhood centers come together to meet and we have great representation on both sides of town. Um, on the Boutwell side, it's myself, two classroom teachers last year and a parent. We had one parent who, um, due to a new job, had to remove herself from the committee early on. And on the <coughs> Wildwood side, we had Charlotte King, two classroom teachers and also two parent representatives. So I'd like to publicly thank them for their time and their commitment for um, being on our committee last year. So last year, the Bowell Early Childhood Center and the Wildwood Early Childhood Center, we had a common goal of increasing um, and promoting family and community engagement by providing monthly opportunities for staff, students, families, and members of the Wilmington community to gain the necessary um, skills, knowledge, and opportunities to kind of provide school-wide initiatives that we were taking place. For the staff and the directors at both the early childhood centers, we worked collaboratively with our parent advisory council and our school advisory councils. We are very blessed that we have a very active um, parents on, on both sides of town and who support us in all of our initiatives um, throughout the school year. So we were able to provide families an overview of our school improvement goals, both the preschool and kindergarten curriculum. We brought in um, some programs for student enrichment. We had support services um, available and community resources available to provide students and families. Um, we've noticed over the past few years that our families are changing, uh, so it's important to make sure that they're aware of the community resources that we have available to them. Uh, our students participated in many um, community outreach activities, both at the Boutwell and the Wildwood. We participated in local outreach activities. We worked with um, the senior centers. We worked with the um, veterans. We worked with the fire department, police department. We had uh, community um, enrichment day. And we also were able to bring programs into our schools to celebrate diversity and awareness and disability awareness. And throughout the year, students were provided opportunities to kind of showcase their accomplishments. Um, both early childhood centers came to school committee meetings and presented something that they felt they were very proud of, of achieving. So it was nice. So um, although it's not listed as one of our improvement plans for this year, both Charlotte and I will continue to promote family and community engagement for the 2018-19 school year. So last year at the Boutwell Early Childhood Center, the other goal that we had in place was that we were going to fully implement PBIS at the Boutwell Early Childhood Center. And I'm pleased to announce that we have been very successful with that. 100% of our staff last year implemented PBIS into their daily routines. And members of the PBIS team and myself, along with a coach from the Wadigo, were able to create and provide staff a mission statement. We were developed three core values, a behavior matrix, 13 detailed lesson plans, a school-wide and um, student and staff incentive recognition program, which we call PAUSE, and a data collection system. So all of that took place last year. Professional development and training opportunities was provided to staff to better orient them with PBIS and to talk more about the tier one practices and, and supports that we put in place at the Boutwell. We had a parent join our team last year to kind of get um, that perspective, so that was nice. And we wanted to get some feedback from parents in the community, so we conducted a survey in the spring of 2018. We received 90 surveys in return, and of those 90 that we returned, 97% of the families um, were satisfied with the behavior expectations, the consequences, and acknowledgments utilizing PBIS at the Boutwell. So for this year, and this kind of, you know, is a good segue into our goal for 2018-19, is we're going to continue to implement the tier one supports that we have in place, and we're also working to identify and implement tier two targeted features. Um, we are in the process of identifying and clearly defining unexpected behaviors that occur within the Boutwell Early Childhood Center that interfere with both social and emotional 
um, social, emotional, and academic success. We are in the process of creating a teacher response protocol or a teacher response flowchart. Um, when those happen, who is, you know, kind of not responsible, but who should be the one that is, um, you know, kind of help me here for a second, but, you know, kind of like who is responsible to help in those situations. So we do have teams that um, are developed, and so it's nice so that everyone is on the same page and that can be identified. We are also working on an office referral form to improve in communication and our data collection. And again, we, our Langley goal is to develop a universal handbook by the end of this year so that if we have any new staff come in, they have an understanding as to kind of how this is in place at the school, what this looks like, and that this is just common language amongst everyone in our building. So for this year, again, we have um, this year at the Boutwell, we have two new parent representatives, and, Sh and Charlotte has um, a Wildwood teacher and a Wildwood parent. So I spoke very briefly um, before, and I, it, it is kind of, a, it piggybacks a little bit, but we're going to optimize the benefits and ability of PBIS. And we're going to implement a teacher response protocol when, un when addressing unexpected student behaviors by June of 2019. So what that will look like is we are going to continue to meet monthly throughout the 2018-19 school year. As I mentioned, we are in the process of creating clear definitions. We are working on developing an office referral form. And really what that teacher response protocol flow chart looks like is it's a written set of procedures to deal with unexpected behaviors. Um, then we'll construct a universal support handbook and we will continue to provide input to families and community members. So the staff at the Boutwell is going to continue to maintain tier one supports that are currently in place. Uh, we will, they will provide feedback throughout this process. They are brought into this during staff meetings and all, you know, staff's invited to come to the meetings as well and we have a really good turnout. And we're going to continue to collect classroom data to assist with some decision making when we come up with these protocols. And they're also going to participate in professional development opportunities to better understand the above features that are going to be created for this year. Also, one of the school improvement goals for the Boutwell is during the 2018-19 school year, 100% of our kindergarten staff will follow a balanced literacy model by implementing um, readers workshop, the reader's workshop structure into their daily routines to be able to improve consistency and effectiveness of literacy instruction. And what that looks like this year is Kindergarten teachers and support staff are going to continue to participate in job embedded reading workshop professional development opportunities. Our first full day um, coaching with TLA will be at the Boutwell on November 8th. Um, I've been working closely with the TLA consultant um, scheduling that day so that there's a lot of one on one work being done with teachers. We're going to continue to utilize the Lucy Calkins units of study to teach reading skills and strategies. We're going to be implementing conferring strategies three to five times a week using the research decide teach format. And we're also going to develop strategy skill groups within the classroom during daily instruction. And just this week, um, Dr. Regan and Holly Banashevitz um, has come by and they kind of did a literacy walkthrough to kind of take a look and to see what that looks like in a kindergarten classroom. And boy, was it busy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I will continue to meet monthly with the district um, elementary literacy coordinator, as I mentioned, Holly Banashevitz. We will be conducting frequent learning rocks throughout the 2018-19 school year. We will be providing valuable feedback to the kindergarten teachers and support staff. And the goal of conducting the learning walks is to establish action, action steps to improve consistency and effectiveness of literacy instruction throughout the building. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Sorry, I talk very fast. Mr. Yeah. Axtell. Uh, I have uh, two quick ones. The first is there are a lot of reference to, references here to unexpected student behaviors. Mm -hmm. Could you describe what? Those are, sure. Or so or maybe we can't. They're unexpected. We don't know. Yeah. Anything. Well, <laughs> it, and it depends. Sometimes you know. Sometimes for for kids, it could be non-compliance. It could be aggressive behavior. It could be sometimes students are dealing with things at home. 
um, that we're unaware of. Um, there could be a change of family. There could be, you know, unfortunately, a death in the family. And these students could have, you know, different um, mood disorders that, 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 they, that they exhibit. Um, so it, it varies. You know, it could be noncompliance, simple noncompliance. Um, so unexpected reactions. Unexpected of reactions of things that wouldn't typically bother somebody, but all of a sudden something else might be bothering them and they react very differently. So it's just making those are kind of the unexpected behaviors that, that we see within the Early Childhood Center. Okay. That's good to know. Anybody else regarding Boutwell specifically? No? Okay, great. I think we're ready to hear about the wild play. Okay. You'll be hearing a lot of the same information. I won't um, repeat too many things. But thanks. Um, so as you saw, this was last year's um, advisory council. I won't go through that again. Um, similar, we had very similar goals last year. Um, I think um, Mrs. Walsh did a great job reporting out on those, so I won't repeat myself. Um, the only difference I would say is that the Wildwood is um, a year behind we were in the second cohort of PBIS so we're kind of able to duplicate um, what the Boutwell did the year before which is great uh, I talked about that last year so it makes goal writing very simple um, and it's nice to have some exemplars to work from so we've been really utilizing that um, I don't want to jump too far ahead but I think we can go on to the next one again this is this year's school advisory council um, so this year's goals, um, we are in that, as I said, um, the year behind for PBIS. So we are in our first full implementation year, which is really exciting. Um, for our um, kickoff, we had a kickoff for parents at orientation. Um, so every parent, preschool and kindergarten, was able to hear about what our plan was, what the work the team has already done. Um, and then we had a kickoff for staff um, with a nice breakfast, which is always very motivating. Um, and we were able to provide them in hand with their lessons that the team created, um, with the PAW system, with the staff PAW system. Um, so we are, um, we were pretty excited. The team is really enthusiastic. Um, we have just invited a parent to join, so she hasn't actually become part of the team yet, but she has agreed to take this on, so we're excited. Um, we are meeting bi-weekly because um, there's much work to be done in kind of the initial stages, so we feel that we need to meet more. Um, we are utilizing um, coaching at every other meeting, which has really been helpful. Um, we are weaving PBIS into our school-wide community meetings, and I think you all got to see at the last um, school committee meeting a little bit about what we're doing with our core values, and you got to see a little presentation on kindness, which the kids love and are still talking about. Um, we are providing um, PBIS updates for staff and families at least at a minimum monthly, um, going out of my monthly newsletters, just a little bit about the work that's been done, to talk to your children about the pause they're receiving, and also to let parents know that we're collecting all that information, um, kind of as you did, um, tracking how many paws are given, if there's any deficits in any areas. Um, and we're also, uh, we have surveyed our staff on the lessons that were taught because this was our first time teaching them. We want to hear from staff how it went, if a lesson seemed particularly effective, if it seemed to not be effective, um, and what lessons need to be revisited, which at the early childhood centers, as you can imagine, we'll be revisiting the bathroom lessons quite frequently. Um, we will revisit a playground lesson later um, because obviously when the cold weather comes, we'll be inside for quite some time. It's important to revisit those things again. So um, the important thing, I think, to for everyone to understand and the staff to understand and parents that this is a work in progress. It's not perfect, but um, we're willing to take feedback and change things as they go. So, so far it's been really successful. Um, and then the second goal is very, very similar. Um, it's pretty much exactly the same as the um, Boutwell to continue to implement Reader's Workshop, to continue to utilize the TLA coaching um, in a very similar way that Boutwell will be. Um, this year, last year we did um, a tremendous amount of work on centers and literacy centers for students. We'll continue that work. Um, we've also had a literacy walk um, where several classrooms were observed um, working on those centers. We're utilizing some time at the um, full day professional day to create a center library for teachers to access. And we'll do um, more focusing on strategy groups this year. 
Um, and then we will utilize our monthly data team meetings um, to assess the progress of both the program and the student success. Any questions? No questions no? for the wild. Right. Okay, <laughs> great. Thank you very Thank much, you. ladies, Thank you. for the presentation. So before us, we have a recommended motion and we need to approve the suggested school improvement plans for both early childhood centers, the Boutwell and the Wildwood. Would somebody like to make a motion to approve those? Mrs. Bryson, I saw your hand first. Thank you. Mrs. Burns, thank you. A seconded. All those in favor? That would be unanimous, Tristan. Thank you very much. Okay. Now I think we have our elementary school. We're going to start with the Shawsheen, please. Mr. Ferry, you're going to be joining us. Please guys come sit with me. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so the right clicker here. Okay, so um, this was my school advisory council uh, for last year, and um, Mrs. Flaherty, a teacher, Mrs. Patterson, Mrs. Toth, and uh, Mrs. Natawada as a parent. We do have new people that will be participating this year. Uh, when we wrote our school improvement plan, it was for a two-year plan. So I'm just reviewing our plan from last year that we started to implement, and it's ongoing this year as well. There are a few updates just on based on some of our progress that we have, have made. Um, so again, Following the theme of Rita's workshop, we had a Rita's workshop goal for grades one through three with teachers increasing their knowledge base. So all of the action steps we were able to accomplish this year with teachers, um, students participated in independent reading every day, increasing the amount of time. Teachers learned and implemented conferring using the research decide teach format. That is still an ongoing goal for us. Conferring is sort of the next step that teachers are working with when they're meeting with students during sustained reading time. <laughs> teachers have and will continue to use anchor charts. This is all part of the program and the units of study. Um, teachers created a place and system for students to store books. That has to do with our classroom libraries <laughs> and um, how we're, we're leveling and sorting books. Um, teachers implement a system for students to choose their books based on interest. Teachers teach students how to choose just right books. Teachers have established classroom libraries which have been organized and teachers will do daily mini lessons. So those, this goes along with our reader's workshop where the, the teachers should be based on their training and how the implementation takes place. And then as you go on, the expectation grows. So this is just an update based on how far we had come of things that we're looking for this year now being the second year. So at the Shawsheen, teachers will continue to do PD from TLA three times a year. Teachers will continue to plan units of study. Teachers will confer with students and collect data on students through conferring. As I said, that is a goal that we really um, are looking, looking towards this year for teachers to do. Uh, teachers will create a data system to collect conferring data. Again, taking it to another step where they're actually collecting data on this and using that to differentiate and, and help their instruction. Teachers will create or use a form for next steps when conferring on individual students. Teachers will assess students using Ames Web benchmarking three times a year and utilizing Fontis and Pinnell. So that all goes along again with our two-year goal for Reader's Workshop. Uh, goal two, um, review MCAS, this is closing the achievement gap, okay. Review MCAS data with data special and literacy coordinator. Evaluate beginning of the year Ames Web testing. Identify which struggling learners are receiving support services. Meeting with the special educators to ensure current goals align with standards towards individual student goal for reading. Review reading specialists scheduled to target class interventions for struggling readers. Meeting with reading specialists and grade level teams to share the data on an ongoing basis, which is student specific, and participate in targeted walkthroughs focusing on reading instruction. So um, again, this is a continuing goal. It's identifying students through a variety of means and then uh, assessing them and meeting with different individuals to provide targeted instruction. Um, I feel like this might have got mixed up, that slide. This, this, the updates here should be along with the goal on um, parent and family <coughs> communication. So I'll just 
wherever that slide is, I'll go back to it. But uh, the parent and family community engagement goal was much like what other my colleagues had about family outreach using Twitter and blog account and um, having the students come to school committee and do different presentations, all school meeting. Some of the updates to that where we are incorporating a birthday book bin and Flipgrid for families to share reading online with each other. So uh, that is something new. And when students come down and receive a birthday book or a, a book for a celebration, uh, inside the book there is directions on how to go online and do a Flipgrid. I don't know if anyone's done Flipgrid before. And they can do a video with their families and submit it to me. And um, sometimes we share it in the lunchroom with the other students. Uh, hashtag value reading tweets is something that we're starting this year to help promote the curriculum happening with reading within our schools. So when I see things in the classroom, when I'm doing walkthroughs and I think, wow, that's, you know, that's great, or I see a student doing sustained reading time and he's, he's sharing a book with someone else, I am going to start tweeting out hashtag value reading. Uh, parent volunteers to support Festival of Trees and educational foundations. So this is, again, just making an extension of the community involvement. So it's not just isolated to the school. It's all of the communities that help out, like WEF and WOW, and trying to get the families and the students more involved because they contribute so much to, to our schools on a daily basis. Um, so that, again, is just is part of increasing the family and community engagement. Um, 60 days um, of hunger bags. I'm not sure if people are aware of that. It's something we participate in, and it has to do with um, students who may need more resources, and we're involved in that in the schools where we um, have a coordinator, and we make sure that students who um, need to go home with food on the weekends and so forth. And so that is another community program that, that we're involved with at the school. Okay, um, this is our PBIS goal. Uh, so we're continuing on with our PBIS team. We are actually in the third year of implementation at the Shashin. We still do have a coach that comes um, twice a month or every other session, so actually once a month now because we have meetings every other week. And um, much like the Boutwell, we, um, are moving along with all of the things that we said that we would establish with our team. And we have uh, roles for the team, uh, vision, meeting norms, schedules, uh, bi-weekly meetings. We have a behavior ma matrix. Um, and we're, this year, we're establishing a data system on a means to collect information on you know, how many paws uh, students are getting, how that impacts within the classroom. But everything takes time. We have a team of 10 individuals on the PBIS team, and they work together to plan and develop and vote on all of these things along the way. Uh, we also do PD at every faculty meeting for at least 15 minutes. Um, and so it's been really exciting. We have our Shawshank t-shirts that we established last year that were developed by the team, where all students in the school have one um, provided for them on, for the first go around. Uh, so this year for the update on PBIS is that they are going to establish timelines for teachers to teach lessons. They're going to provide the time for teachers to incorporate the 30-minute lessons into their instruction with lesson plans. So all the lesson plans have been developed according to the matrix. So much like uh, the Bile, Boutwell and Wildwood shared that you know, we have lessons for the bathroom respect and responsibility in the lunchroom, in the cafeteria. We have our golden award. So I don't know if many of you remember last year when the kids came and talked about respect, resilience, and responsibility, and they showed some of their golden awards. We have, when you walk into the Shashin, the first thing you'll see is um, the display case, and it has the golden awards in it. And that has been a huge success so far this year, and the kids really like it. And working with the PBIS team to develop all school monthly meetings. So we always incorporate our three R's into that. And this year, they're also creating a banner in which students commit to being possum. Um, so we are just continuing to work on that. It's, there's always work to be done for PBIS. And it's been really great so far. Hey, good evening. Uh, um, nice to see you all again. It's been a while since I sat in this chair. 
Um, I'm going to make do the best I can with this. I'm kind of late into the game, and I'm going to lean on my <laughs> colleague Lisa a little bit. Um, here's our school advisory council. You see, Mr. Strazik is still up there. I just neglected to change that. Um, but this, this, and Mrs. Hackett also retired, so this is evolving a little bit. But I think the rest of the members will still be in, in place uh, for the duration. Uh, the first goal. Uh, I don't want to repeat a lot of what what Lisa said, but. Um, um, this is our reading, our reading instruction goal, uh, talking specifically of Reader's Workshop. Um, the, uh, just, just in general, the Wooden Street School has made great strides with Reader's Workshop. Uh, we're basically at the full implementation at this point. Um, the, the areas that we're still working on, we're currently refining the con conferencing skills. I think at least the school is in the same boat. Um, but all teachers, uh, students participate in independent reading every day. Uh, all teachers regularly use anchor charts, create a place and system for students to store books. Uh, that's our classroom libraries. Um, I have, there was a question about the classroom libraries. Um, the li classroom libraries are very important because um, Reader's Workshop requires a level of independence. So, so the materials need to be laid out in an organized fashion so that students have their materials at their, at their reading level uh, in the genres that they, that they choose so that they can independently take those books and read while the teachers is conferencing with other students. So the, the, the libraries portion of this is actually quite important. Um, all teachers daily do mini lessons. Uh, we're currently, data is currently being gathered to inform the next set of steps of instruction. Um, teacher language is being refined to ensure delivery of targeted feedback to students going forward. Uh, the second goal was to close the achievement gap with students with high needs and those with non-high needs in the area of reading. Um, happy to say that um, our achievement in English language arts on the MCAS, uh, all students Met, the, met our target, our high needs exceeded our target, and students with disability also exceed their target. So I'm pleased to, to let you know that. Um, where are we here? PBIS. PBIS. Um, PBIS. Um, we're, we're a year behind the Shawsheen. Um, I believe it was the Wildwood. We're in, we're in cohort two. Uh, so really, we really got started to dig in on this last year. Um, uh, the uh, PBIS team was established. A team vision and meeting norms were established. Uh, we met on a biweekly basis with the coach meeting every other meeting. Uh, we established core values. Uh, the behavior matrix was, was established. And um, then we sort of brain started brainstorming the whole notion of this lesson planning, which is, which is really the meat and potatoes of this. Uh, we broke it down into three, three phases of, of lesson plan development. We wanted to talk do some lessons around core values a second set of lessons around key concepts, and then the third section is the school environments, which is the most important part. We, we felt we needed to do the first lessons before we got into the school environments, because some of these concepts would apply to all of the various environments once we get into that. Um, we completed phases one and phase two, the key core values and key concepts, and really we're at the point now of looking at the school environments. We're just beginning that. Uh, data collection still needs to, uh, system still needs to be developed. Um, and we also established a, a validation station last year, which was really a staff recognition bulletin board, which actually was a big hit. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with that. Okay. So yeah. So uh, this is this is with, these were the I think the slides that originally were. So if there was anything I left off, I'll just quickly go through here. But these are the same <coughs> um, readers' workshop. They're just in more detail about participating in professional development, um, accessing books. Um, this was the, here was the, the slide for the community, family and community engagement, students' presentations, classroom teachers will invite families in to showcase events, promote family literacy nights, increase our communication content, PBIS team will be reestablished and roles of members determined. So we had, we had combined these together last year, review of the behavior matrix and data system. Okay, so that slide was just happened to be at the end. It was supposed to be in the middle. No worries. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. <laughs> That's it. Any questions or comments from committee members? Let's start with Shawsheen first, the improvement plan for Shawsheen. Mrs. Burns. I just had a, a quick question that actually it, both of you could answer, and I think it was very helpful. With regards to how you're currently collecting data, specifically PBIS, I know that you say that um, right now it's, it's just based on student-teacher surveys. Going forth, as you create additional data collection tools, is there anything that you, you're currently doing to support not only the surveys, but I mean to just get a clearer page? I know Shawshin's a year ahead, so 
it may not be appropriate um, yet for the Woven Street, but I, I was just wondering if those aspects are taken into consideration as you build yeah. um, the, these yeah. PBIS data. So we data. collect sort of soft data right now. Okay. Um, so although we don't have a complete system in place, uh, the system is that, you know, um, students re get pause for different things, although the lesson planning has to be complete, which we're going to finish up next week. So it's sort of like a soft opening when we were handing out pause for responsibility, respect, or resilience. So all the paws are collected. The teachers collect them in a jar when children receive them. Mm -hmm. And we actually, the PBIS team collects those paws so we can sort of see students that we can see right now the amount of paws that are given out around. But the data collection is going to focus next on, it's almost like relationship mapping, mm -hmm. um, on st students that are getting paws, students that are not getting paws, and then analyzing that data. And everything's it, consistent throughout the classrooms and teaches right. as to how they're... And that will help us to say to see what's happening where in different areas and are they getting them more at recess and lunch. And, and so it, it will take, once the lesson planning is completed, meaning all the teachers, which will be next week, have done every lesson within the behavior matrix, then everyone, the whole school has a complete understanding in all the areas, responsibility, respect, and resilience in all the different areas of the school. Okay. Then the next meeting, it's on the agenda to figure out a data system. And again, it will be a trial mm -hmm. because the PBIS team has to develop it. Mm -hmm. Then they're going to do PD for the faculty at mm -hmm. the next faculty meeting, and then they're going to roll it out. I would think yeah. that that would impact the PD piece as exactly. well. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Very good. And they constantly are getting, even though there's 10 members on the team, that is a variety of members, teacher assistants. Um, we have a parent that is joining the committee also. So even though we have a variety, mm -hmm. um, we still, there's means of communicating with they, they, with the Additional whole Additional ways of bringing in data. Yeah. But as for data for relationships and social, emotional, and behavior data, I mean, we keep data all the time. As you know, if okay. incidents occur with, with incident forms or different things, right. so that we manage it that way. As well. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. I just wanted to be sure yeah. that wasn't the only source of evidence oh, for yeah, the goal. No. So. It's ongoing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions specific to Shaw Sheen, Mrs. Bryce? And well, the mine's not to Shaw Sheen. It's about the Woburn Street? Yeah. OK. All right. Happy. It's actually for both. I just am okay. curious to know, is there a PBIS team for each school, or is there one team? Each, for, school. each school has their own, and then those teams are developing the lesson plans? Yes. And so the lesson plans at one or might be different, or they're yeah. the same? But they could be different? They could be different, because the development of PBIS, and we have coaches that work with us, mm -hmm. but it really has to come within your school. Mm -hmm. um, and it's developed by the team. Uh, we are working, we do have like a, a PBIS sort of folder within Google Docs that we can all share. And I think that is something that we're working on is coming up with a district PBIS team that we can have representatives for each school work together on that. Um, so yeah. Interesting. And then the, my other question was how do teachers access that? So it's they go to this Google Well for Drive. Shashin, we have, a, we have everything in Google Drive, every lesson's there. So for example, a lesson plan um, on responsibility will have books which teachers have been provided in each grade level with all the books that they need to teach the lesson. So they have that. That was, we put that in, you know, our school supplies for the year before to provide that. And then they will also have the same like video link and then suggested maybe five different activities and it's tailored toward grade levels. So teachers have some flexibility if they want to do like an extended lesson, but they all do the basic lesson so that every student is hearing the same message. And then we do the same as about well and while where we we go back and we might say, oh, we've had a few issues here on the playground, let's go back, and they may have a choice of a couple of lessons that they can pull back, pull from, and reteach. That's great. Thank you so yeah. much, Mr. Talbot. Uh, I don't know who, what his name this is. is. Mr. I'm sorry, Ferriel. Frank Ferriel. Frank Ferriel. Nice <laughs> I mean, did, he's never been like introduced as the uh, interim principal, I guess. Yes, I'm yes. the interim principal. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Your question? That was it. That was it? <laughs> that okay. Was it. Great. That Thank you. Yeah. All right. Excellent. All right. So our action item on... Thank you. I didn't see your hand. Sorry. Um, so the, in the um, in the Shawshine presentation, there are a couple of sections about 
um, collecting data on students through conferring and creating a data system for our conferring data. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that will look like? Because my understanding of the conferring process is it's more of a kind of a soft, you know, engaging the student and finding a place of compliment for their reading and note taking and so forth. And I'm curious what you plan to collect yeah. data on. So um, that's where TLA comes in, where they come and provide professional development with teachers. They work with teachers one to one, three times. They're coming in three times. Uh, this year at the Shawshine, and that's also what um, Holly Banishevitz, our literacy co our literacy coordinator, helps to work with on. But for conferring, yes, it is. They sit with the student and they're conferring and they're engaging and they're talking. But in order for that to be effective, the teachers have to take notes on what they're conferring. So when they're working with the student and um, the student is missing the main idea when they're reading to them, those are the notes that the teacher might be taking. So conferring notes. It might be in a journal to start off with, but eventually we want teachers to develop or establish what, what's going to work for them. Pretty much it's the same type of data they're going to take, you know, with the date and the information, but it might look different. Within the units of study, there are actually many, many examples on, con on what the data that they can take with the conferring sample, so they can actually choose a rubric that works for them. And that's what they're going to work on this year, okay. that data. All right, and I had um, one more question for, for both of you. Um, so there, you both say that teachers are gonna be using, uh, continue to use anchor charts. Yeah. Uh, are they making their own? Are they individual to the classroom? Or yeah. is there consistency throughout the schools? So again, within the Lu Lucy Calkins units of study, there are anchor charts that are right in the units of study that they are welcome to just pull out and use. They can develop their own when they're working with the children and they're doing a mini lesson. Sometimes they like to do it right then and there and then hang it up on the wall. So it's a variety, but the teachers all have access to the units of study, which all have samples of, of the anchor charts in it. Some teachers like to use the poster maker. It's, it's whatever they, they, however they want to display it. Great, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions for Shawsheen and Woburn Street? Going once, going twice? No, we're good. All right. <laughs> So our recommended action for the Shawsheen and the Woburn Street School Improvement Plans is to make a motion to approve them. Do I have a motion? Mrs. Bryson, thank you. Seconded, Mr. Bjork, thank you. All those in favor? That would be unanimous. Thank you very much for the presentation. Moving on to our intermediate schools. So, so before we start, I, I think some of our formats were a little bit different. I believe that you all have in front of you in your packets, um, like our like progress, progress on our goals from the past plan, um, but there's no slides for that. So maybe at the end, if there's specific questions to that, you could ask you know, ask us those as well. Um, because people at home don't have that to, to, to see. Does that Great. make sense? Thank you. So I, I can begin, and what I can say is that you probably will hear some um, action steps echoed around several themes, and, and the good news is that you can hear that everybody's sort of rowing in the same direction, and we are all aligned to the uh, district priority planning goals that you've already seen, and, and that is why we are using um, similar language. So we definitely have to thank all of our um, teacher and parent representatives that have helped us along the way. That's large. Um, <laughs> so um, you did all that? our first goal is the social emotional, social emotional uh, learning goal, and it, it directly correlates to the PBIS. Again, Wildwood, Woven Street, and now the North were in the second cohort. So we are a little bit behind, and our main goal this year is to be beginning developing our lessons. Last year, we did an awful lot of work completing our matrix, finalizing our core values, communicating them to the school community, and we made a commitment, um, because we're not as far along, to hold three all school community meetings this year. And so we communicated already our core values to all the students and our expectations. Um, the other piece I will mention is the, is the uh, how our team is comprised. We have had a parent representative all along on our PBIS <laughs> team. <laughs> And uh, we actually added this year a CARES representative, one of our team um, leaders, who also happens to be an educational assistant at the North. 
and we've been talking with Sherry Parker and we thought it would be really wise to be able to extend PBIS into the afternoons, at least around the expectations for behavior and our core values. So that's exciting for us as a team. Um, and so we are very much focused on uh, developing the lessons and creating that calendar, or as Lisa King mentioned, a timeline for those lessons. Um, and, and we do hope to launch at the North fully uh, in, in September of 2019. Uh, here is our uh, effective instruction around balanced literacy. Um, and as you can see, many of the action steps, again, these are two-year plans. So we did have um, uh, some good news to report in our progress update about all of the action steps that we had taken last year and some of the um, effects that have had on, on student achievement. Uh, but here, uh, what I will say is it's very exciting to be in year three of this Reader's Workshop program, knowing that the students have had this type of a model and structure that they have adjusted to from grade two and grade three. So when you talk about stamina, the students really are able to read independently to give that time to the teachers for their conferring. And we are also, we worked a lot last year uh, and we'll continue to really hone our uh, data tools in collecting that information uh, and that research around um, the conferring. Um, I think one of the other pieces that you would also see for at least the North and the West, actually um, K to five, sorry, one through five, is the writer's workshop. We um, sort of learned a lot about our rollout. So this year, all of the teachers, the materials and resources have been provided to them for the writer's workshop. So they have the entire year to peruse, dig in, try some things out before we do a full launch next year. And that way they'll have some familiarity with the materials and they'll be working with the TLA coach to trial some things. And they'll also be a Wilmington University PD offered in the winter. So they'll have a lot of, um, familiarity with the materials. And, and it, that's kudos to the district for uh, putting that first uh, with regard to resources and allowing the teachers to dip in and take a look at that uh, this year. We will also continue with the literacy walkthroughs with uh, Dr. Regan and with uh, our elementary literacy coordinator, Holly Benishevitz. Um, also this year, we are focusing on meeting our targets. And around uh, MCAS and our student achievement goals, um, as, as many of you know, um, our accountability reporting and the way that students uh, take the test and the way that students uh, receive information and feedback on how they performed has all changed. And so now we are focused uh, on meeting the targets that the state sets for us based on our performance. And um, we are really working to intervene with students who are sort of our lowest performing cohort. Um, and that includes strong communication with Lisa Murphy, our STEM lead teacher, uh, meeting with her to review some of the topic test data, as well as even providing interventions. Um, she worked with a cohort of students last year that have found um, additional success this year early on with the topic tests because she was able to work with them around some of their foundational math skills. And it really has uh, proven that the teachers communicating with her, communicating with me, and reviewing that data regularly is helping students make progress. And then lastly, we had our uh, student celebrations and our fami family and community engagement. Um, some of our goals revolve around that. Same thing uh, is using our monthly updates um, uh, for the North, using our social media pages to really communicate and do lots of <coughs> reminders and people feeling like they're in the know about what's going on. Um, also, uh, the Chromecast platform, as you notice, the flat screen, yes, a lot of the schools have them. If not, every school has one you, when you walk into the lobby. But um, literally, when the students are coming off of the buses, they don't make it to the cafeteria because they're waiting for their picture from Dress for Success Day or from Red Sox Spirit Day to show up on the screen. So it's a way that they feel a sense of pride in the school and a sense of belonging. And it really has um, really been a nice feature when the students are really feeling connected uh, to the events in the school. Uh, also, we'll talk a little bit later, and I know that Mr. Shaw will also allude to the fact that we will continue our work with our student council representatives heading over to WCV, CV, WCTV uh, on a biweekly basis, and our first uh, session for that is coming up on November 1st with our student council reps. Last year, 
as many of you saw uh, probably on the update, they were able to complete an <coughs> orientation video for the incoming fourth graders uh, during their third grade orientation. And um, we had some very uh, dramatic performances um, <laughs> by some friends that you may have met last year. But every teacher at the Wuben Street who had were sending up third graders received the link so the students could see this is the art room. Yes, they came on a tour, but it was the students describing their own school and the how-tos and where you wait in the lunch line. And it was very much appreciated by both the um, Wuben Street teachers as well as the students. <coughs> Oh, we go. Um, so again, this is the, uh, the West plan. It's the second year of a two-year plan. Um, I'm, I'm really going to try not to repeat the same things that my colleague Christine has said, which means I might not have much to say. Um, however, a couple of things. Uh, when you look at, oh, let me go back. Um, again, an excellent parent group. Actually, Jody Graziano this year is now a sixth grade parent, so I do have an opening that I'll be filling in my in the current year here. But I, I thought it was appropriate to keep her on this because she was part of the, <coughs> part of the plan. Um, so what I did do differently was I just put them in a different order, okay, just to kind of keep you guys on your toes here. So I have the same <laughs> slides, but they're a little bit rearranged. Um, I will say that when we talk about performance level, I think Christine explained it really well. Um, th there's a new, a new metric that we, that we are now accountable to, which is your lowest performing subgroup uh, that's determined, you know, based on fourth grade test scores and you track those kids for two years. I made myself a note um, here from a meeting that we had last year when I remember the term achievement gap wasn't received too well, so I've removed it from every that single be, thing I have thank in you. here. There is <laughs> no more me. reference to achievement gap again. <laughs> That's for you, Mrs. Prasad, just so you know. Um, and again, it, it, the same steps, you know, it, it, as Christine talked about. You know, we're looking at specific students at specific interventions with them. We're working on uh, both reading and math. Um, and I will say that the, the, the math program, um, it's, we're really we're seeing the fruits of the labor now of like, like the fifth year of this Envisions program. Um, Dr. Brown visited the building today. We popped in a couple of classrooms and, you know, to hear a teacher say, okay, not just what, what's the answer, but how did you get it? You know, and hear like an explanation from the student. And anybody else have a different way and then a different explanation. So kids, are, they're becoming literate in math in that way, which is, which is really exciting. Um, we have the interventions with the LLI program with the reading uh, instructors as well. Um, where we increase the BAS assessments for the students who are on the targeted list. They take the BAS three times a year. They take a beginning of the year, mid-year, and end of year for an, an extra data point for us with that there. Um, and, and from the progress report, you know, that you guys have on, in a different package there, some of these things are paying off because our, our, our you know, our targeted populations, our, you know, high-needs population, um, our disabled population exceeded the targets, which was, you know, really fabulous in this past year. Uh, next slide. Let's see. Okay. Effective instruction. This is all the same readers' workshop stuff. I, I, I don't want to just fly over, but it is the same thing. We're all doing the same, um, you know, focus on the same areas of uh, instruction. Obviously, with the coaches in different buildings, teachers are at different places in this area, so different teachers need different things, and, and they're able to get those things on an individual basis from the coach because the coaching sessions are now set up, you know, 45 minutes one on one with the coach, which is fabulous, you know. Um, so that's really been effective going forward. Uh, let's see, again, family community engagement. Um, the Chromecast thing is so cool, isn't it? It's so truly because, I mean, we're, we're blessed with, with just excellent um, library media specialists. I don't even want to say librarians anymore because I think it's probably offensive to them. But um, they just do a great job of updating that all the time. And the kids, they come out of the calf, they come in the front door, they're just watching the television, you know? And, and, it's, and it's pretty cool the things that they're seeing. Um, we actually start WCTV tomorrow is the first day for the West. We alternate our weeks, you know, back and forth. Um, yeah, so we actually changed the, thank you, we changed this year. Um, instead of doing like, you know, like the, the, the video about the school, now what the kids are going to be doing are working on a series of PSAs, like public service announcements, based on us, on, on the school values. Um, so, so they're excited to start that. They'll be doing storyboards and scripts and everything else, you know, and um, we'll have those probably by, by April. Yeah. They'll have like a set done, you know, so we can share those with you. It's, it's, it's good stuff. Um, one thing the West uh, is doing this year, and this is um, uh, kudos to the PAC, we're actually having, um, and I should say the Shaw team as well, um, we have room parents this year. 
you know, the, the PAC worked to get us, every, every classroom has a room parent assigned to it. And, excuse me, their job is really just to be like a liaison between, you know, the parent council and what's going on in the classroom. So it's kind of new, we're kind of figuring out, you know, what the parents should be doing and shouldn't be doing and what the roles are and everything else, but it's, it's, it's been working out well so far. So that's, that's a neat thing going on. Is that it? No, okay. And then lastly is the, um, you know, student social, social emotional goal. Um, we have um, the same things, you know, the, the class reps, um, we have the class reps, we have in-house programs. Our school psychologist, um, Mrs. Dion, does a mind up program in all the classrooms on a regular basis, on a regular teaching cycle. Um, you know, mind up is like a combination of, you know, different uh, calming strategies, um, self-regulation strategies and, and things like that. So. Um, you'll see that we don't have PBIS up here formally. We, we started the cycle of PBIS actually two years ago. Realized a lot of PBIS stuff is stuff we had already done as a staff a few years before that, so we're kind of resurrecting what we've already started to do. Um, I've, I've had a couple of meetings with the PBIS coach just to get some guidance on it, but we're using our own stuff that we have because we found out that it was, it was the same thing, you know. Um, and that was it. Sorry. Great. Any questions for Mr. Shaw or Mrs. McMiniman? Mrs. Burns. I just, if you could clarify for me, um, Mrs. McMiniman, um, with regards to your math goal, you you use a 3%, which is, you're the only goal, that's the only goal I've, I've seen throughout all the um, school improvements. Um, how do you how do you measure the 3%? How do you know, are you, is it based on this time next year that that's what we're shooting for? Is that it is what we're shooting for because now we will have two years in a row with the new accountability system okay. and we're really trying to make sure that our high need students um, who are performing lower are going to be closer and closer to um, the, the aggregate group. And so it really comes down to are we meeting our targets and are we narrowing the gap between those two groups. And so this year we have our new system, so we really can't compare it, and, and the state has really asked us not to think about comparing the two systems. Right. So at the end of this two years, we'll be able to compare same to same, if that makes sense. It, no, it certainly, it certainly does, and I just wanted to make sure I understood it. W would that not also apply in the ELA or, or the other aspects? It would, it would, and we, I think what we're really hoping too is utilizing the Reader's Workshop, that that gap, and, and if you saw on the progress update in ELA, we had some strong performance and strong growth okay. um, by all groups of students, which was really good news, and I think it really talks to the program and having it work pretty quickly. So it is the same type of idea in okay. ELA. We are still trying to get those two groups closer together in both of their achievement as well as their growth. Very good, I just, yeah. the measure, so. On that so, note, if I thank could, you. I think part of the reason is why we're cautious about the ELA piece of it at this point in time is, if you think back five years ago to when we first rolled out the Envisions, it took, it took a few years for people to kind of grasp it, mm -hmm. and we actually saw like a little bit of a like a dip in the scores and stuff like that. So it, it might not be like the fairest time to evaluate that because you're learning the new program at the same time. You know? Thank so, you, that's a good um, if, perspective if, if that I didn't consider. Makes sense, Thank yeah, you. yeah. Any other comments or questions on our intermediate school improvement plans? No, okay. So there are, again, some action items here and that would be to vote to approve both the North and the West Intermediate School Improvement Plans. Can I have a motion, please? Mrs. Bryson, thank you. Second, Mr. Bjork. All those in favor? Great. Thank you very much thank for your you presentations. Sure. Uh, a couple of uh, final comments before we move on to the next agenda item. Um, first off, thank you to our principals for being here this evening and for their uh, work in collaboration with their councils. Uh, you know, these school improvement plans uh, for me have always been, you know, a window, a small window in terms of the work that uh, happens in schools and, uh, and, and certainly hopefully uh, these uh, for our community just represent that. Um, it, uh, it's also a reminder of the work that, uh, that we do around these tables. Uh, policy and budget helps really make all of this uh, have meaning and, and, and is possible. We're in a time of transition. I've mentioned this to you before and so the uh, my request to the principals was to continue uh, 
uh, working within multi-year plans, uh, and that's what you saw here uh, before you this evening as well as last time with the middle school and high school. And as we uh, march towards uh, shoring up our strategy for moving forward, uh, so too will the alignment of these plans um, in, in due course. But I think if anything, uh, hopefully you, you and members of the community got a sense that there's a lot more uniformity I think in terms of the programs and services that, um, that I'm coming to learn uh, that happen across uh, our districts and the duality of schools at each level. And I think that that's an important piece to note. Um, finally, which what was mentioned here this evening, and just as a reminder for members of the community, that uh, MCAS is, uh, uh, you've heard some reference of that. Uh, on November the 14th, I think it is, the next school committee meeting, uh, Dr. Regan will provide what it really is an annual update, but there's a difference this time around uh, given the change in the system. So. More information to come on MCAS and how we did as a district. I just don't want members of the community to think that we haven't been addressing that. We will in time. Uh, and so stay tuned for more information on that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm just going to acknowledge there was a double <coughs> rainbow yesterday, and today there's an enormous full moon. I noticed as I was driving in. So if we're a little disjointed this evening, that maybe that's the explanation. Um, and keeping with that theme, I'm going to skip a little bit here in our agenda and let's hear from Dr. Regan on our pilot programs for elementary science that seems to be a good flow for us and if any of our guests want to sneak out because there's a game to watch okay feel free <laughs> Well, good evening. Thank you for having Lisa and I here. Lisa Great. is our elementary STEM coordinator. Um, also listed up is Amy Iasconi, who teaches grade five at the North. She is a lead science teacher in the district. She couldn't be here tonight, but she's played a, a pretty significant role in helping us Great. pull some of this information together tonight. So tonight we're really just looking to get your approval around running a small scale pilot for elementary science curriculum. Um, we don't have a lot of specific information about the two programs yet because we haven't conducted the pilot. So we would plan to come back to you in the spring with what would be, I think, a little bit <laughs> more detailed information about both programs and a recommendation for um, which program to go with. So, so as um, this pilot begins, if we do this, we would like to do two programs. One is Pearson, which we selected because that is the program that has been purchased for the middle school. Um, we thought it would be important to investigate what the K-5 or elementary component of that program looks like. And the other is STEM Scopes, which is a program that was explored a little bit um, last year by some of our elementary teachers. It's a newer program. It's 100% online with no uh, workbooks or consumables, so it's, it's a little bit different, and we'd like to have our teachers take a look at that. Um, there's a slight change in the second bullet where we're going to scale it down a bit. Instead of having two teachers per grade per program, we're going to have one per grade per program. So instead of 12 teachers, we'll have six um, district-wide that will uh, participate. And we're not going to do K-5. We want to, again, we're, we're trying to keep this manageable. Um, and we feel like we can still get a sense of the program if we use our upper elementary grades. So we're looking at teachers in grades three through five. Lisa's already worked with Amy and principals to identify who these teachers are. Um, and they're gung-ho to get it started if we can get approval. Uh, we'd run the pilot um, hopefully late November through about April. Um, the program would provide opportunities for those teachers to interact with each other. We bring both sides of town together on multiple occasions, which I'll talk about in the slide about the timeline, just so that they can discuss the two programs, the strengths and weaknesses and whatnot. Um, both vendors have asked for access to teachers, which is a good thing. They want to come in and be able to explain the program and, and provide them with any support they need during the pilot. So we'll work that out as you know the pilots begin. Um, and then again, we hope to come back to you in, in April or May, most likely May, with a recommendation for purchase. There was a question that had come through Dr. Brand about costs and will it be included. We will put a place or I will put a placeholder in the FY20 budget request based on estimates that these two vendors will give us. Um, so that, of course, will be, will be planful about that um, as we go forward. Um, just a little history. Currently, right now, K through 5, we don't currently have a formal 
science program. Since I've been in the district, we have dabbled in little pieces. One year we had the FOSS kits, we had them for a year, we used them, then that kind of went out date. Teachers are kind of pulling everything together. So now that we do have the new um, standards, the next generation science standards, we really need to jump aboard getting a current um, science program to support the children. Three, four, five, as you know, also take the science MCAS, so we need to support them, and I believe this is the current year where the next generation science standards will be implemented on the MCAS. That was one of the reasons why we also did the pilot with three, four, and five to kind of get them going. Just a little bit about the standards, they do spiral, so it's very similar to like the math and ELA now. If you haven't looked at them yet, they do spiral right from K through five. So a little bit about that. Um, we thought with the Pearson Interactive, again, because the middle school had it, we thought it would be a great thing to look at. And then um, the high school's already aligned with it. And again, as you know, obviously the five, five, eight, and 10 have the MCAS science also. We did explore STEM scopes a little bit last year. Myself, Amy Iscone, and one other teacher at the Woburn Street, we did go see a district. Um, we, Amy Iscone and myself went to a PD one day for it. And then we actually went to a school district to see it actually implemented. So that was kind of sparked our interest to kind of why we chose that, that one for another, um, for the two to do. Basically what it will look like is the town will be split in half. So the North and the Woburn Street is going to be piloting STEM scopes. And then um, the Pearson Interactive will be done at the West and at the Shawsheen. And then all the teachers will come get meet together and discuss things. And they may even go in to observe each classroom so they can get a taste of the program and they will get training in both programs. So they'll have feedback on all of that. So some of the highlights of current science programs, um, you know, these are new sort of, on, they're almost all <coughs> online. Um, they're all aligned with the next generation science standards. And as is usually the case in Massachusetts, the next generation science standards weren't good enough. <laughs> so Massachusetts created uh, an even better version of the NGSS. <laughs> Um, and these, these programs, of course, are either already or in the process of aligning. Um, STEM Scopes has their Massachusetts aligned version out. Pearson is, is working towards that now. Um, it's not a, a big lift for them to do that, but both vendors have, they're aware of that and that there's, there's a process in place. So um, they're based around inquiry-based learning activities. Um, there's a lot of real life topics. Um, to try and help kids connect um, science with the world around them. Um, Hands-on learning activities, um, blended learning modalities. I mentioned the workbooks. The Pearson program has a workbook mm -hmm. component. STEM scopes doesn't, but they both do have hands-on through their kits, which are, you know, at the elementary school, you don't have science labs, so you need to have these kits that have um, everything you need for these <laughs> different activities and experiments. So both of them have different uh, kits that go with their units. Uh, for the pilot, we will be given for no cost. Uh, by the way, this pilot doesn't cost the district any money. Um, they are both vendors are, are going to give us a sample of kits. We won't get the whole complement <laughs> of kits. That's just cost prohibitive for them. Uh, they won't do that for free, uh, but they will give you a sample of them so that we can get a taste of what their kits look like. And we can also see, you know, we have some other materials that are tucked away in closets here and there that we <laughs> can pull out to use for hands-on activities as needed during that. Um, and the nice thing about these is that they, they, you know, they're understanding that literacy and mm -hmm. uh, reading and writing in particular, you know, and literacy are very important. So they're creating programs that tie into that. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are connections to, um, to literacy all throughout these new programs now. And they have level readers that they can use during um, the readers workshop that hopefully they'll be able to blend in some of that time and hopefully our goal is the science time will be used for like labs kind of hands-on experiences and the hope is once we adopt a program and we really have something solid at the elementary level for science that as teachers start to con will continue to expand their classroom libraries that they'll consider purchasing more books that are science focused for nonfiction. Um, offer, you know, opportunities for kids to pull out of their libraries. They're already doing that. I've seen that in a lot of libraries, but if you have a core program that's in place, it's a lot easier to sort of match books to something you're doing in class. I didn't jump, did I? No. No, you didn't. 
Um, so basically why? Well, we kind of don't really have a choice, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but it's exciting. I think kids want to get that hands-on learning. They want to know what's happening out in the world and the why. So let's give it to them. I think kids are really excited to do the science labs and do that hands-on piece. Both pieces have that rea real life videos in them that the kids can see and look at. And I think that's great. And both programs, which are nice because they're digital, are updated. So if there's a change within the science world, as there always is, they're both also updated. Um, even though Pearson does have the publishing book, so they may not be, but STEM Scopes definitely is. That was one of their guarantees that that is updated constantly um, because of that. Um, we want to obviously increase, increase the enrollment in STEM enrollment in courses through the high school, <coughs> people to in WHS to pursue STEM fields. Um, and obviously to be able to improve our science scores on, on the MCAS. So we've talked a lot about this, but that this is the basic timeline. <laughs> we did, uh, you know, the uh, initial training, which is the second bullet, um, that may be pushed into early December. November is a really short month, so um, there's a potential that that would that push into early December. We don't think that that would impact the rest of the timeline at all. Um, the plan is to have our pilot teams come together, um, you know, Officially three times, but we could increase that, but have a January powwow, a March powwow, and a May powwow where we can get together, start talking about um, the two pilots and what's happening on both sides of town, um, and then again come back here in the spring to talk with the school committee about potential next steps. Um, and if we do adopt a program, then we <laughs> would have WUs and trainings that would be offered in the summer, and then uh, we would mirror those trainings in the fall for those teachers that can't be available in the summer. So we would find ways to make sure that it's offered both in the summer and at the beginning of the school year in September. And the pilot teachers also will be communicating with the other staff members who are not on the pilot team, whether through um, staff meetings or going to visit the early childhood buildings. We'd also invite some of the other teachers to come and watch a lesson. So it wouldn't just be the pilot teachers. They'd be doing the lesson, but we would expose all of the teachers in the community and yourselves if you would be interested into coming to see one of the science you know, lessons once we get going. Um, we'd welcome you to come and also come and view a lesson um, to see so you can see what it looks like. <laughs> Comments or questions from the committee? Mrs. Byrne. I have a very quick one. With the STEM scope uh, piece, is it known, would that segue into the, the Pearson, Pearson products that we currently have? I mean, I would, I would just say that because they're, they're aligned to the standards, they mm -hmm. sh it should. Okay. Um, yeah. In theory, so we, that's something that we would have to look at. Yeah. The, and the the other thing I think they'd want to, I'm sorry, the other thing they'd want to look at is, is the type of learning platform is it so foreign from the Pearson that then that might create a problem from grade five to six. We don't and, know. And you did you say, did you say that Pearson is still aligning their product to the, the current the new standards? Yeah, they have a product that they're ready to launch. They just the, the one that that we're using at the middle school. My understanding is that's not. That doesn't have the mass component, Massachusetts component, 100% there yet. So, but that because it's online, that it just the change is, it just happens. We don't have to purchase new materials or anything oh, okay. when they make those adjustments. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, because the workbooks that we purchase through Pearson are consumables, so every year they get used and, and, mm -hmm. and recycled. Um, but then the online component that, that goes with the new workbooks every year that gets updated as okay. needed. So. Thank you for clarifying. And the Massachusetts aren't huge. There's not a huge yeah. difference in them, so the update's not that large of a difference. Very good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Questions? Mrs. Okay, go to Mr. Ragsdale and then Mrs. Bryson. Um, so I, I do have a few concerns about alignment um, to the to the Massachusetts standards, and the. I mean, we, we went beyond NGSS for a reason and made, I think, a couple of substantial changes. And I, I hope that, the, that, that at least to the extent we can, it will be tricky when they're not currently aligned to evaluate that. But um, I, would, I would hope that we're going to um, make the recommendation, um, have a at least a decent weight to give into how well aligned that they'll be to the Massachusetts standards, both in terms of adding the elements that, that we've you know, added to it, especially the reliance on technology and engineering as an equal, equal level of science to physical and life science and earth science. Um, 
and uh, but also just in general that things that we sort of took out. I mean, it's it's a game of kind of like, well, what did we remove? Like there are parts we deleted and then parts that we added. Mm -hmm. It's always easier to add something on than it is to just mm -hmm. kind of take away the other parts. Um, I mean, I think that the you know even though we went our own way on ELA and math as well, that the, the Massachusetts ELA and math standards are closer to Common Core than our science standards are to and pure NGSS. Mm -hmm. And so um, I hope that you know, as we make this recommendation later on, that we, we try to give that a fair amount of weight to make sure yeah, that we're. Absolutely. I would agree with you. And I think aligned with the Massachusetts standards. Right, and that's when I talked to the rep from STEM Scopes. Is one of the conversations that I had with him about you know the, the readiness of the product that we would purchase. Is it going to be? And, and that's that's what he's telling me. That is it is it will be. Um, so yeah, we will definitely mm -hmm. um, do that. It makes no sense to purchase something that isn't aligned to the mass mm -hmm. standards and. Um, that will be a, that will be a big driver for mm -hmm. us. Yeah. Mrs. Bryson, so <coughs> two questions. My first one is, when was the Pearson purchased for the middle school? Like how <coughs> how long ago was that done? Is, forgive me for not having the history, but I think this is our second year. So it's relatively new. That. So we wouldn't yeah. be switching that anytime soon, basically. No, so I this is an I idea that we know yeah. where this is what we're keeping. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then my other question is. The um, moving from the two teachers to the one teacher, just having having done pilots before, you know the level of support you're given sort of during that pilot stage is so mm -hmm. is so strong and so yeah. good, and so you have a sort of a deeper level of understanding almost, mm -hmm. I think, when you're doing that. So moving from two to one, I'm just curious as to why was it teachers? Okay. <laughs> it really was teacher just interest, but because so much, yeah. because we have so much curriculum going on, going on currently, um, myself and Amy Isconi will be in supporting them also, but they'll also get to meet like the fourth and fifth grade teachers and we'll get them together. So that will be our challenge that they'll be able to, to communicate. But it really came down to the workload of the teachers. We didn't want to, you know, we beg, plead, and borrowed. Okay. Uh, so that means that there'll be one teacher, say, in fourth grade piloting Pearson yes. alone yes. with no, with, with well, support, with, yes, with but no other teacher to sort of co-plan with. Or yeah, and I think they could possibly do that. There are other, other teachers that said, well, maybe I'll look at it like mm -hmm. while they're working on it. So I think the fourth grade team will kind of dibble and dabble in it, but the official pilot program will be that one teacher. So I'll be doing a lot of driving around the district <laughs> from building to building. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we recognize it wasn't ideal, but it was yeah. the elementary level is really there's a lot on them right now with sure. the Reader's Workshop and Writer's Workshop and Foundations and Envisions. At some point yeah. you have to take it on, you know, so that's mm -hmm. sort yeah. of, no, so I, I and I just yeah. think when you have that opportunity to do it in this way that feels less risky because right. you're piloting it, mm -hmm. it's, you have a, but then there's also, they're going to go with one. And so if I piloted Pearson all yeah. year, I did all this work to then <laughs> switch over. So there, I understand that too, which is what I actually thought might have been sort of it's a lot to ask someone to do and then to have them have to adopt something else yeah, the following yeah. year. So I totally understand that. I will say both vendors are willing to do double. So if, if something changes and we had another else. teacher that wanted to do it, we they're both on board for six. And, yeah. okay. um, That's yeah. interesting. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? Comments, questions? Thank you very much for your, your presentation. Um, I understand that this was given to us as an FYI. Stay tuned for more information, so no action on our part at this point. Great, thank you. Great, thank you very much for your time. Give our folks a moment to exit. Thank you. Okay, let's jump to the financial report, which is our final for the fiscal year 2018. And I believe Dr. Brandt or Mr. Ruggiero uh, will present. Mr. Ruggiero, okay. thank you. Awesome. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, a couple meetings back, we mentioned we were in the process of closing FY18. We're in FY19 and getting ready for FY20. So this is the closing of FY18. I'm happy to report that we closed in the black with a positive balance of $8,193.53 for the fiscal year. Um, I just I first want to thank again Jackie Raffi and Frank Antonelli as well as all the staff, um, administrators and staff in the, the schools. It's a collective effort and um, I think we should be very proud of our ending balance um, and we're ready to move on. Great. Any comments or questions from Mr. Ruggiero? No? All right. 
thank you. Yeah. yeah. So well, well done. <laughs> thank you. Again. It's great. Love seeing a little leftover, right? <laughs> Excellent. Okay. One more item under new business, and then we'll go back to our old business. Uh, so Mrs. Burns, as our legislative representative, brought to our attention, there's been a proposal before the Department of Homeland Security that could have an effect on some school programs. Um, she has shared with us in our packets, I think it's a 12 page. It's 183. 183 total page. Um, and ironically, just this week, I received an update from MASC regarding that, um, and it's one column. So uh, it's, it's kind of interesting how it's presented. Um, Mrs. Burns, would you like to share anything with us regarding this? Thank you, um, Mrs. Prasad. Yes. Um, basically, this is really a, a Homeland Security proposal that's open for uh, comments. Um, as Mrs. Prasad said, it really is a about 132 pages of which 13 of the component 13 pages of the component um, is in your packets um, at the moment I think the biggest concern uh, and of which MASC sent out an alert uh, to just bring to everyone's attention is that should this proposal which um, basically I'll read from an article that pretty much summarizes it um, that the rule seeks to bar non-citizens from from obtaining green cards if the government determines that they're, they're likely to become public charges, which are individuals likely to use public benefits such as food stamps, which are SNAP, Medicare, Medicaid, some parts of Medicaid and Section 8, and other, other housing subsidies. In long-term effect, should it be implemented in its current form, would be to strengthen barriers to entry for entry, uh, to entry for low-income people who are immigrating um, through family, which basically what it's saying is that um, the government in this proposal is um, basically weighing in people who are here legally as well as those illegally as to whether they'll be um, uh, drawing from government benefits. And in doing so, if they feel that somebody's medical background or financial background, they would be deemed a risk to um, accessing U.S. Um, you know, government subsidies, um, they wouldn't allow in. Um, or they would they would not be allowed government subsidies um, to try and prohibit it. And how this could potentially roll out should this proposal actually go through in its current state is that um, it could risk our students, um, of which uh, come from some from immigrant families, both legal uh, and illegal. As as far as I, I don't we don't know that's speculative on my part, but it would prohibit them from uh, such benefits as SNAP. Uh, which is the food uh, stamp program, SSI, uh, temporary assistance, disability ben benefits, or access to uh, government assistance programs. Um, it could also further prevent school districts from actually identifying kids who may need additional services, um, such as uh, food permit, reduce and free lunch, because it would prevent their parents from registering uh, for those benefits. Um, there are some additional articles on the web I'd be happy to share with you that um, some families are um, opting out of government benefits so that they won't get deported, so they don't come up on the radar. Um, of course, this would impact families and the students that we may serve. Um, yeah, and there's really, in, in speaking with Dr. Brand about this too, um, there's really not a good way of finding out how, what the impact could potentially be to Wilmington. I think right now the only potential tool we could have in guesstimating it would be um, through the free and reduced lunch plans that we offer our students. But, um, but it, it could impact our, our students from not eating, um, not eating throughout, you know, on the weekends. Also, um, access to health care, uh, vaccines, things of that sort. So. Um, Anything at this juncture could be purely speculative, but these impacts could actually be real if this proposal were to go through. So what I've brought forth to the board, besides interest in the discussion, is that this is a time to respond to such proposal. And I didn't know if the board wanted to, wanted to weigh in on their thoughts to the, it's open comments to this proposed proposal. So. Um, MASC is encouraging any committee who wants to weigh in on it at this juncture to do so, or otherwise we can just uh, 
just remain and see how what transpires. Any questions or comments from committee members? I would just offer that it, it is difficult for us to judge what the potential impact is to us here in Wilmington. As, as Dr. Brand had, had shared with you, um, I see this as a bigger national political issue. Um, I don't think that we can make any immediate impact. I think it's more of a wait and see approach might be best for us uh, to see what happens. Uh, certainly MASC I know will keep us apprised as members mm -hmm. and I'm sure if any of us see anything online or in print that might be helpful for us all to consider we can share it unless anybody would like to propose any sort of motion of action. I'm sorry what what would we do I mean would we provide would, would, would it be a letter the, what would happen exactly? It would, it would, be, <clears throat> such, it, it would be that. Um, that we would respond as as a comment you know commentary how we feel about the proposed plan if, as it relates only to the school school district and what it could mean for our students and our student body um, because of its it's it really is just drawing comments from what's just been written mm -hmm. um, it, 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 lend, it could only lend a voice you know what I mean it may not may not ha it may not impact the outcome we know exactly that you know public education is currently uh, struggling at the federal level um, the, the uh, political state but um, it's it's whether or not we want to lend a voice to that commentary um, whether to I don't know if the commentary I'm, I'm, I'm surmising that it would go to our either state or federal legislature in you know considering this proposal and how it's written but as I said I don't it's you know it's just an open comment period and my understanding is we could comment as individuals. Absolutely, sort of. absolutely. And that's another thing to consider if um, anybody's of interest as opposed to doing so, you know, doing so as a board. Mrs. Bryson. In which case, if we, if we did respond as individuals, we wouldn't have to be speaking directly about how this would impact our district. We could just provide comment. A absolutely. As a citizen. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. And that might offer more flexibility. Right. Mr. Um, <clears throat> I think I'd just quickly add that this is um, that part of this public comment period that this is just the, the, a standard part of changing any kind of regulation. We do this in Massachusetts whenever we change uh, regulations as well that mm -hmm. uh, there's just a period of public comment in which I think all comments are kind of technically from individuals although you can represent yourself from, from anyone uh, you know, from anyone that you'd want. Uh, it, it seems that there wouldn't be, or it would be hard for us to argue a direct impact in Wilmington, and and so I think that if there was any kind of collective action, it would be more of a general concern for public education or public education in Massachusetts, which would include large urban districts where this could have more of an effect. Um, but I think that would be the sort of the purpose of any of any collective mm -hmm. any collective comment that was submitted. Sounds good. Okay, great. So let's jump back to old business. And under old business, we have our continuing discussion on. Excuse me. Uh, Ms. Broussard, do yes. you, should, should, should we then just forego any group um, going forth? And if any members would like to individually comment um, to this piece, they can do so? Just so that sure. I. Sure, I think that's what people are saying. That if they want to comment as an individual, they're more than welcome to do so. Correct? Yeah. Okay. okay. Very good. Thank you. Great. Thank you for sharing that with us. All right. <laughs> Let's go back to old business. And uh, this is a continuation of our discussion from our last meeting. Um, I will share that I did get a little bit of feedback after our last meeting. Um, although I had said these are MASC's proposed uh, items for discussion over the next year. I think there were a few people that thought perhaps we were talking about changing policy here in Wilmington. So I want to make it very clear to the public that these are discussion points that MASC will be tackling. They're looking for support at their annual meeting. Mrs. Burns is our delegate to that annual meeting. So at our last meeting we were just discussing the proposed items to see how we as a group felt about those. 
Uh, some of them we were pretty quick to make determination on, but we have a couple that, that we wanted to talk about a little bit <coughs> further. Um, the first one being number seven, resolution number seven, which is a gender identity inclusive athletic participation policy. And I'm just gonna read the resolution part. Therefore, it be resolved that MASC help file legislation which would have the effect of protecting LGBTQ students from discrimination, harassment, and bullying by that schools should treat students based on their gender identity, protecting their privacy, providing access to gender neutral restrooms, locker rooms, private stall showers, using their preferred pronouns, embedding sensitivity training in professional development and providing uniform accommodation. So it's specific to participation in athletic programs. Um, and their rationale is the at-risk behavior for LGBTQ students, which includes suicidal ideation, is sharply reduced with some basic interventions. So if we go back to our minutes, kind of our discussion evolved on this. I think some of us were a little bit unsure uh, what this was asking for, actually. Um, we obviously want to make sure that we here in Wilmington were following the law, which I am comfortable that we are, the law as it stands. Um, but is there any further discussion? And Mrs. Burns, would, were you going to make an amendment or propose an amendment to this resolution? I actually have, and I apologize for not uh, sending this particular resolution around, um, only because I was um, trying to work on the most cohesive language. Okay. Um, I, in saying that, though, um, I would like to, I don't know if this is something that would be, um, we'd bring forth, you know, that we'd, I would ask MASC to, to urge the legislature, legislator, Legis the legislature, <laughs> excuse me, um, as much as um, maybe considering um, creating this for our own district policy, and I'll explain. I'll explain wh why the what I'm proposing, because um, there is an aspect that I, I really do like from the language, uh, which I don't think is represented in the law, but I think um, may serve well. Is that um, Schools will treat students based on their gender identity or identify using preferred pronouns and embedding sensitivity training and professional development to provide uniform accommodation. Um, I think that is a uniqueness for any students. And um, again, I, I don't think this is something that MASC could argue, you know, you know work on at a legislator, legislative level, but I, I but at least just pose that for the board members as to what they think as a part of our um, discrimination and harassment policy to maybe add that component or sort of, it's a starting point. Isn't this what question three uh, covers? You're talking about the, the, the ballot mid, issue? The ballot up? issue coming up. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not familiar in its entirety. Um, it, it, but well, the you, gist of it is it, it covers the, the, the bathroom, the you know changing rooms and things mm -hmm. like that, and discriminatory against LBGTQ and things like of that nature. Mrs. Burns, um, as I would revisit again, this resolution is as inclusive to the athletic participation policy, which we try to see, see, but I have difficulty staying focused on, and I think as we touched upon at the the previous meeting, um, a lot of what's included in this language is currently written within our, our district policy and the laws as it pertains to harassment um, and accommodations. As I said, um, we need to, and it's difficult because it's, I'm, pa I'm passionate about um, the plight in, in, in equal rights and, um, uh, you know, in discrimina discrimination for anybody, but we need to focus that any student that we have in this school district, regardless if they're a part of the um, LB, GTQ, if I said that correctly, um, community, or if they, again, suffer from any other um, uh, body image issues or anything, we, we need to, as a school district, provide those accommodations uh, individually to whichever student needs it. So we need, to, we need to be flexible for any student who might have the same um, situation is what I think my perspective is. Um, and, and, you know, and that's what I'm just trying to... 
So I was I did not attend last meeting, but I watched it and um, and I I understand your your um, impetus and the fact that they're singling out this particular group uh, as opposed to being more universal. But I think that's because historically this group has not been protected. It's only recently that they've been protected. I think if this was 100 years ago, this resolution might have been for women because that would be very recently protected. So I don't think this is, I, don't, I personally don't see this as exclusive in any way, shape, or form from other demographics. I think it's just, I think they're singling that, the, the group of LGBTQ out because they're so recently protected. And, and I, I ask for people, I could, maybe I'm not wrapping my head around it, but as again, as a school committee, we have to represent all. And, I, and, I think and that's where, and I think that's where I, um, I'm hesitant with naming just a particular um, group of students uh, when there are other students who have, um, and I, I recognize the irrationality behind it. Um, but we, we still have to rep represent the, all of the community for any student who may um, um, need those similar supports. And that's, that's where my hesitation is. But again, I think, and I, I suggest this as um, the language we may want to consider for possible future policy as it relates to our student body and, and some of our students as um, how we, as a district, treat students um, based on uh, based on their gender identity, um, using prefer like using preferred pronouns, and sensitivity training. I, I don't think this is something that we should say. Okay, yes, let's create a policy around it. But I think even for future discussion, this might be an avenue to explore how we might enhance that aspect. Which I don't know if our um, policies cover that. Mr. Ragsdale. <clears throat> I think whether we support this policy or not is not, or sorry, I shouldn't say, whether we support this resolution or not mm -hmm. is not the same thing as whether we endorse this policy as something that certainly that we want for our district, uh, because this is not something we're writing from scratch. Right. Uh, this is some, something that you know has been written by other people, and then there's a question of how the delegate assembly will vote on that. Um, I mean, I don't really, I don't want to throw shade at the Framingham School Committee, but I think this is a really sloppy resolution uh, that's not very well written. I mean, it starts out, I mean, it's identified as in gender identity inclusive athletic participation. It doesn't even actually address athletic participation, but some of the other aspects kind of surrounding it, um, as far as, you know, bathrooms and restrooms and so forth. Issues like, uh, you know, the pronouns, which really have nothing to do with athletics, but are a much more broad category of, uh, of dealing with um, dealing with these populations. And I, I don't necessarily feel the obligation to try and rescue it. Like, I don't think we need to go in and try and amend it sure. to align it with exactly how we would do it, because mm -hmm. I fully recognize some of the points that you're making and, and their validity. But... It's not our resolution, and so I don't know that we need to go and try and conform it to the way that we would draft a policy here. So whether we would support it as is or not, I think I would be more inclined, despite my criticisms of it, to support it than not, that uh, I think voting, ag voting against it would be seen as, would be taken the wrong way, would be indicated, at least, at least in my case, like the reason that I would be inclined not to support it have nothing to do with the general principles that it's advancing. <clears throat> And so I think I would um, be inclined to support it as written. Um, it will probably be essentially moot anyway after the ballot initiative um, in November. Right. It's just before the conference. <laughs> right, which I right. Literally will just be before right, the, right, yeah, before literally happened, just before the conference. Two days before, uh, before the conference, um, before the delegate So assembly. I think we have a couple of options here. We can propose amending the language of the resolution we can accept it as written for the purposes of the general meeting, or we can make a motion, somebody can provide us a motion um, to not support it. I think those are our three options as a committee tonight. Mrs. Burns, I do see your point that in the future, maybe we see what happens with the ballot initiative in November, maybe we see some of the discussion that comes out of MASC's conference annual meeting. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the future, this is something that we as a district should consider um, for 
consideration of our policies. Mm -hmm. Am I succinctly articulating <laughs> what my attempt was? <laughs> Nicely done. Okay, thank you. So that being the case, those are the, the three options I think we have as a committee. Would somebody like to offer a motion at this point? I see two, three hands. <laughs> Mr. Ragsdale, I'll go with you first, okay, and then um, I'll, we'll I'd see like, where I'd, we're at. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion to support the resolution as written. Great. We have a second. Do we have any discussion on that motion? No. Okay. <laughs> Are we, do we want to take a vote on that motion? We have to, we have a second. At this point, now that we have a second, yes, thank you very much. All right, all those in favor of supporting resolution number seven as written. Okay, I think we've got five in favor, five in favor with two no's or abstentions? No's. Two no's. No. Okay, great. Thank you. Dr. Brandt. Not to belabor this, but <laughs> I just, uh, just for members of the community, I just want, I think it's important to point out, notwithstanding the resolution and, and the respective action of the body, but uh, the notice of, of non-discrimination for the Wilmington Public Schools, I just think that this is important to note. All educational and non-academic programs, activities, and employment opportunities at WPS are offered without regard to race, color, sex, religion, national origin, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, homelessness, age, and or disability, and or any other class or character, characteristics protected by law. So uh, again, notwithstanding the specific resolution, I think it's an important point as it relates to our policies uh, and our pursuit and commitment to, um, to inclusiveness. Um, and equity, and on a deeper level, uh, notwithstanding specifically the focus here as it seems to be on athletics, uh, on a broader level, I think as a district, uh, we ought to be taking a look at um, access, inclusivity, and, uh, and this very uh, commitment that we have as a district. Um, that's outside of the bounds of MASC and its <laughs> resolutions, but I just think the community should know that there has already been certainly to some degree a commitment to this happening. So. Absolutely, thank you for that. Okay, moving on to resolution number nine. Access to information for parents and students who are clients of special education. And again, I'm not gonna read the whole text of the resolution, simply the therefore be it resolved that MASC urges the legislator to amend the state law to require that parents and students be provided with a copy via email or mail all of the assessments that are performed for students in the family's preferred language at least five days prior to any meeting at which parents and students will review a proposed individual education plan, otherwise known as an IEP. So that was just a reminder. Um, again, we had quite a good discussion, I think, at our last meeting about this particular resolution. Um, we had a good presentation earlier this evening that talked about the steps in the IE process here in Wilmington. Again, we don't want to confuse Wilmington policy with proposed resolutions. Um, Mrs. Burns, earlier in the evening, you had a amendment, but you referred to possibly changing your proposed amendment. Actually adding to the, uh, adding, adding to an it. amendment to the amendment. Um, I've, um, the proposed amendment, because I really do think that this is one that we should at least um, uh, it's, it's workable uh, to provide an amendment. What I would like to propose that Wilmington School Committee puts forth to the delegates um, is, therefore, it be resolved that MASE urges the legislature to amend state law to require the parents and students automatically be provided with a copy via email or mail of all the assessments that are performed for students in the family's preferred language no less than five business days prior to any meeting at which parents and students will review a proposed IEP. In addition, I would, um, and, and please help me with the, the verbiage because I tried doing it um, tonight. Um, I'd also like to re recommend adding, thus recommending an extension to the IEP timeline process from 45, day, from 45 days to 48 business days to 48 business days. Again, I'll have to work that language out. Mr. Bjork. Um, firstly, regarding your uh, language additions, I think automatically is a superfluous word. Sorry? 
I think automatic, adding automatically is superfluous. It, it doesn't say the law requires that parents and students may be provided. It says students will be. So automatically, is, it's redundant. It's not necessary. That's requiring them. So that, I think, is un unnecessary. Okay. Um, five business days, I, I understand the, the, the idea behind that. I have to, I have to say, though, and I was, uh, I'd be willing to vote in favor of endorsing that, I'm on the fence now. After Alice's presentation, I'm inclined not to endorse this resolution at all. But, um, given, given the timelines that she just she laid out. Well, but in the added piece that I just shared, granted the language may not be um, sharpened, um, in saying that I would extend currently, as she said, right now Massachusetts has a 45 days turnaround, 45 day turnaround right. in the evaluation process. I would extend that yeah, I don't, to, to three days. I, I don't want to extend that. Well, and that's not what this is. I'm not, I don't think you can change that date, that timeline right. is the law. That's the way it is. So I don't think, and this. This is a, resol this is a resolution to amend the, the state law. So that's what that's doing. It's not, it's not um, going against the law. It's, it's, it's asking the leg legislature to change the law. That seems like a different resolution. Yeah. The one there, the access to information, that's a, that's that within like a different the law. resolution. Like that would be something that we would. That's an aspect within the law, as opposed to the, the well, timeline being the greater but, part of the law. Well, but, but the thing is, right now, by law, it states that fam families and students will receive the assessments no less than 48 hours. Right. So, what this is trying to do is, is trying to extend that. And with in, in giving parents the ability to g have more time to um, ask questions of whomever the, the providers are. I mean, it's a team meeting. I don't want to say ask questions, but, but be able to crunch on the information they receive within an assessment in order to prepare for the IEP meeting. That's why the, they're asking for an uh, additional time to allow parents to have that time to review the assessment results um, and, and decipher them. And But in doing that, I think what we would also need to do because of what Alice um, stated this evening is that I would like to see an extension going from the 45 days to 48 days because you're asking for three more days for parents to be able to have those assessments to review. I, I do think, especially with the integrity of the reports, that I would want to see um, that change to, to 48 days. I think it's a part of the same area of um, um, because it's part of the time, it's part of that timeline component uh, where um, that as, how assessments need to be sent to parents. I think that's still the component of the law. It's not a different aspect of the law. It's within that same subject well, time. That's what I'm trying if, to. If you go up, oh, I'm sorry. Chairman, no, go ahead, Steve, no, please. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Radstill, yeah. and then I'm sorry, Mrs. Newhouse, did you have your hand up? Okay. Okay. I, I, to me, this just seems like a, a trade-off between having a little more time for parents to review the IEPs um, while trying to preserve the amount of time that the staff has to prepare the assessments and make sure that they're of good quality with the trade-off of extending the overall process even further into the year. This is something that Alice talked about, uh, about that people already feel like, you know, 45 school days is already nine weeks into the year. And so there's a question of whether we're going nine weeks and three days into the school year, whether that trade-off of extending that even deeper into the school year before everything is in place is worth being able to extend the amount of time that parents have to review it uh, without staff losing time to prepare good quality reports. And th to me, I think that's the essence of what the trade-off is, either you know, trying to give them more time, but then make sure that we still have good quality reports mm -hmm. and the, you know, th the problem is that it extends further into the year. Mrs. Newhouse. Um, it can be a problem, I feel, for parents only having 48 hours to review um, evaluations. Um, some of the evaluations are very complex. Um, and some parents want to be able to confer with outside um, evaluators or professionals of, you know, what does this mean for my child? and how can we best present this? And if you get the report 48 hours in advance, not all those professionals are available. 
Um, however, I did say at the last meeting, if we extend, if we extend it to the five days, the timeline does need to be looked at. Like it's just not something that um, can be done. Um, can parents review things within the 48 hours? Yes, it can be done. Um, some of the more complex ones aren't, I would say no. Um, so it's, you know, whether or not you want to give the extra three days or not, um, you know, I think it's case by case based basis. And Mr. Bjork, I absolutely agree with that. I will say though, this this doesn't say that and, you know this isn't. What I think we may be assuming here is mm -hmm. that an IEP is going to be drafted and um, and agreed upon within forty eight hours, and that's not that's completely up to the parent. I mean, if the parent gets the assessments and needs extra time, they can certainly reschedule the, the meeting. Yeah. And that, and then that's not the school delaying the process. But not necessarily because then the school's gonna be out of compliance and the school's gonna be get written up. If the pa I don't think that's the case if the parent delays the process. Well, in, in reality, even if the school and the parents can't schedule within the 45 days, um, it's not necessarily a huge issue and they do, it, they do allow it occasionally, but I do feel like, um, the state, um, when they come in and do the evaluations, they do take note of those, um, even though it was agreed upon by both the parent and the school district that you're going to extend beyond the 45 days, it is still noted, um, in your reviews. Mrs. Burns? And just to segue is, is that if, in fact, certain, sometimes that does occur, whether it be for a medical emergency or something other, sometimes rescheduling to another date where all team members are available can be an additional two weeks out. So in fact, when you're talking about going into making it longer um, to, to accomplish this by what I proposed, and in fact, you do run into those situations uh, that might be avoided or could be possibly avoided, uh, by the extension of uh, the additional time that the parents have with the assessment, um, along with the additional three days um, on the timeline process, you may be able to avoid that, especially in uh, IEP meetings at the beginning of the year and the end of the year, if you have a late school year assessment, it's difficult to get all team members at a team meeting and sometimes waiting for that is three weeks out. Um, and, and that only delays that process even further you know what I mean it, it might think of it this way it might av avoid those situations where we can you know keep compliancy with a little more extension allowing parents to have that access and to ask those questions um, if needed or even just to crunch on it um, it might be shorter than than what th it might be a shorter turnaround but I think it's important though too, and I think one of the perspectives may be to this, is giving parents the ability to really break down something, especially if it's not their genre of knowledge, their education of knowledge, giving the ability to be able to actively contribute to their child's IEP and the creation of that IEP. And I think that's kind of the other premises um, behind this aspect. Mrs. Bryson. Um, and I think the big piece of the actual meeting is to go through all of the assessments. So when we get these assessments 48 hours and we're looking through it and trying and, and I, we're working with parents to discuss. But I think at that meeting is also the time if parents have questions or they're confused about something and the people who did the assessments are there to, to talk you through it and explain it to you. And I think that's a big piece of that meeting, having more days to do that prior to the meeting you might just be generating the same questions. You know, I initially I was in support actually of this resolution as written having heard from Alice and just thinking more critically about the <coughs> quality of those reports and knowing how many assessments are happening and how long that takes and not wanting to take children out of those content areas. And I think as a, as a former teacher, I know that, I feel that, and now hearing it from thinking, oh geez, this actually could make a very big difference um, in the quality of those reports. And so that's kind of what I'm thinking now and not in support of the, of the five days. Mrs. Burns and then <laughs> as, as a parent who started off this process, I would have 
uh, more in, in learning this process, not just the educational piece, which I wasn't aware of, but also the medical piece and what that impact is to my child, I would have welcomed a little longer time with that assessment piece that, so I could break it down and figure out whether it be through Google or whatnot. Uh, when I have a child with a disability, it's not just having the ability to sit down in a 48 hour period when I have a child who may be receiving services and there's other responsibilities outside of the house sometimes to our, our kids. So as a parent, that ability to be able to strategize um, or come in with a, a, a game plan of what this might look like and then hone it with the team, it, it didn't afford me that. You know, it's a learning process, especially in the beginning, um, and it's all self-education on the parent's part, and I think this would allow parents to be, a, a, a give them a firmer foundation in being, in participating more effectively within their child's IEP process, and that's how I think I'm looking at it, and. Um, and that's what I kind of, um, want, you know, that was kind of the reason for my amendment and recommendations put forth that I think we also need to give parents who may have no knowledge of some of the medical diversities of their kids' disabilities and are learning that in the same right, trying to figure out what their education is gonna look like and seeing what that's gonna look like within a classroom. Um, it just would offer them, I, you know, a more, I think, cohesive, and, Again, in asking the, the same questions that you, you brought up, but I, I think it would allow parents to be um, stronger advocates in, in that role. So, thank you. Uh, yeah, I was, I was just gonna say that uh, when I came here this evening, keeping in mind uh, Mrs. Burns' proposed amendment, um, I was comfortable supporting the resolution as it was written. Yet, uh, hearing the presentation earlier this evening, uh, Mrs. Brown Legrand shared with us, uh, which was very clear and concise, and really talked about the practicality of that time frame and how, to, how yes, it is how, very tight. At the same time, I'm thinking about the kid that needs to be assessed because a question has been raised, right? So, how quickly can we? get them through quality assessments and make a determination and how quickly can we get them the appropriate services so it is the least disruptive to their year, least disruptive to our staff, to the, also acknowledging the parents, but, but you know, hearing that it could be halfway through the school year before this poor kid gets any services is a little concerning to me. And I guess I didn't realize in practical terms what that could look like until I saw the visual. Um, so at this point, I am inclined to not accept this resolution. So, Mr. Bjork. <laughs> I just wanna say, I respect and appreciate the spirit behind your, your, your amendment. I will say from my experience that I have a couple of IEPs going on that are extremely complex. And the, the first time I went into a meeting, an extra three days wouldn't have been nearly enough for me to, to grasp all of it. Um, I, I understand, I, like I said, I understand the spirit, but I really do think if the parent wants to delay the process, I think the parent has the ability to do that. But I think this, for us to, stay compliant with 45 days whenever possible, I think is important. Whereas if, if compliance is 48 days, then that's the standard. That's what we can do for every single IEP meeting. And I don't think that's what we wanna shoot for. So I am I'm, I'm gonna vote not to endorse this resolution. Mrs. Burns. And as Alice stated this evening, the 48 days or the 45 days that it currently is is a cap. Right. That can be done depending upon, not all assessments have to fall into a 48 day. They, if it's one assessment, sometimes that, that turnaround is a lot quicker. That's just a cap not to go over. So it's not saying that the district will use all of the 48 day. It, it just would allow for them to ensure that they wouldn't go longer than 48 days on, let's say, more of the more complex. It's not something that they have to utilize the whole 48 days for. So that's the other aspect to keep in mind that some things could be turned around a lot quicker and cohesive um, concrete assessments could be 
issued sooner than that. It's just a cap. So that's the other thing I just wanted to. I, I, I completely understand that, but given every, the number of IEPs in this district, in every district, I'd be, I'd be uh, curious what the average is. How many are less than 45 days? So at any rate, that's, that's my piece. Thank Mrs. you. Newhouse. I'm just gonna say, I, I thought I was in um, full support of this and then hearing Alice, I feel like I'm torn because I do think it's important to give parents as much time to digest this information, but I also, being on the other end as a parent, feel that we need to get the student the services sooner rather than later. Um, so to extend it, I think, could be detrimental. Um, you know, and is, are there other ways to help parents understand this and digest the information? Um, because I know personally, and, and I know not everyone is this way, um, you know, I take the two days and then, you know, let's get the meeting done and move on and figure out what's best for the child. So I feel like I'm very torn on this one. Mrs. Burns. I, I, and I think that's what we need to consider at the end result. It's what's better for the student. I think that's the ultimate outcome, you know. We're all in agreement with that. Mm -hmm. What's in the best interest of the kid? Okay. Any further discussion? I this has been a really good discussion. Um, I don't want to stifle anyone's opportunities to share their opinions or ask questions of the group. But are we ready to take some action one way or the other? Are we all getting tired. <laughs> all right. So I think I think I'm hearing that we have two options, possibly three, if somebody wants to propose amendment to the current language in this resolution, that's one option. The other option is for us to move to support as written the resolution. The third option is to not support the resolution as written. Okay, and again, this is a resolution before MASC. This is not policy here in Wilmington. Just wanna make sure that that's very clear. Mr. I would, Bjork. I would offer a motion that we not endorse. Is there a second on Mr. Bjork's motion? Mr. Talbot. Okay, so now we're at the point where we are going to take a vote. All those in favor of Mr. Bjork's motion to not support the resolution as written, please signify. Okay, we've got one, two, three, four, five on that motion. Thank you. I would, sure. I would just Go say ahead. that's not an easy motion to make. No, it's I, not. There is part of me that would almost like to write a summary of our discussion and submit it to the MS, MASC so they understand uh, the discussion we had and the timeline we heard just yeah. prior to our discussion. And I think we've had two meetings worth of really good discussion, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm happy for us. I'm happy for our community because it's, it's an important topic. I think all of us are showing our passions about it as well, which is good. All right, so I think we got through our old business. I think we got through our new business. Bylaws. Oh. We have one more. Okay, what did I miss? Bylaws. Oh, the bylaws on the, oh yes, of course. I think we forgot that one last time. Okay, so another proposal by MASC is changing the date of uh, let's see. The board asked to amend the bylaw by changing the July 1st date noted in the text in bold face to no later than June 1st. And this is referring to MASC's bylaws, not Wilmington School Committee bylaws, about the date in which school committees can propose resolutions. It's a month difference. Okay, their, their rationale that they're providing uh, here is moving the submission date of resolutions to June 1st will give adequate time for the resolutions committee to meet and report out. It also aligns with the submission date for nomination of MASC officers. Discussion. <laughs> Mrs. Burns. Um, my concern surrounding this change to the bylaw, although historically Wilmington hasn't um, ever submitted a resolution, 
I think the deadline of June 1st, it, it, it may be more, I don't want to find the right word, more difficult to come together to develop a resolution if there is something that we want to bring forth to the delegate um, assembly in, in the fall. Um, April, May, May months are, get very busy with um, school events um, and presentations and getting a committee to create a resolution, have it in before the June 1st deadline. I, I'm just wondering if should we ever opt to submit a resolution if it might be more difficult or problematic um, in doing so. Uh, given that after June 1st, a lot of uh, school activities are ending. Graduation is at the, the second weekend of June and it tends to slow down in preparation for the uh, closing of schools. So I just wanted to offer um, that out to kind of start that discussion and thought. Mr. Bjork. Only because I didn't contribute at all in the last meeting, I wasn't here. And I know it's gonna seem like you and I are count point <laughs> counterpoint tonight. <laughs> I have very little passion in this particular resolution yeah. because we've never, we've never, it's a bio we've never submitted one. Right. Yeah. Um, however, I would think that if we were, if there was something so important to us that we would want to uh, propose it. I would think that we wouldn't, it wouldn't be a three month process. I think, I hope it would be something that we'd formulate over the course of an entire academic year. So if we moved it up, I, I would hope that it wouldn't, it wouldn't affect us by 30 days. Um, that being said, I'd be very happy to vote against it. I, 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 I will follow the, um, the majority of the committee on this particular one. I just didn't want to handicap the committee by the, you know what I mean? Anybody else have anything to say about a month David difference? David, you're looking, both, both David and Tom are looking very pensive. Uh, I, I agree with Steve that I really don't care how this resolution <laughs> turns out. Um, but, uh, but I also agree that if we, uh, if we ever wanted to submit a, um, a resolution, I think we would be able to do it by, uh, by June 1st. And so I, I don't think I see a good reason uh, to vote down the resolution. If this is something that they think would be helpful, helpful to them, then I, would, I support it. Would you like to make that as a motion? I move to support the resolution as written. As written. Great. Is there a second? I'll get the second. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> All those in favor? That looks like that one's unanimous. Okay, good. We got through that. I will make note in following MASC's listserv and the discussions that have been taking place regarding the resolutions, um, a lot of committees have not given the resolutions the attention that we have. Um, it, that's just my on the face uh, perception. So I guess that's a, a kind words to us mm -hmm. that we have taken this seriously, that we've had some good healthy discussions on these issues. Um, Oftentimes, the resolution proposed in six years that I've seen them really don't seem to have much impact on us here in Little Wilmington. So, great. All right, now can we move on to public comment? Seeing none, okay, great. Um, other reports and subcommittee reports, do we have any? The only thing that I was going to add for those of us that are on the school committee and family communications subcommittee, uh, which would be myself, Mrs. Bryson, Mr. Talbot, and Mrs. Burns, you're the alternate there. Um, I think as we heard in the school improvement plans over the last two meetings, there's been a big emphasis on communication and engagement of families. Um, and we've talked about it a lot and haven't quite gotten there yet for various reasons, but uh, stay tuned because I think I'll, I'll see if we can get a date on the calendar to start talking about some ideas from a school committee perspective. Okay, so just FYI on that. All right, any other subcommittee reports? Any correspondence? None this evening. None this evening. Okay, then we have a final order of business. We do have an executive session. Um, so the Wilmington School Committee will enter into executive session pursuant to M Mass General Law 30A, Section 21A and 2 to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions 
or contract negotiations with non-union personnel, and this refers to our negotiation with our administrative assistants. Um, a possible motion would be to enter executive session from which we will not return to public session. Would somebody like to offer that motion? Mrs. 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 So okay, would somebody like to second? Mr. Ragsdale, okay, this requires a roll call vote. Mr. Bjork? Yes. Mrs. Bryson? Yes. Mrs. Burns? Yes. Mrs. Newhouse? Yes. Mr. Ragsdale? Yes. Mr. Talbot? Yes. And Mrs. Broussard? Yes. Okay, thank you.